Welcome back to Hypercosmic Odyssey. Tonight's chapter is Waterfall. October 21st, 2387. 6.22 p.m. If Torn attempted to guess at the value of the jewels, high fashion, and personal vehicles of the crowds approaching Yorami's theater publique, he'd very quickly lose track of numbers in the tens of millions. Much of the crowd are familiar faces he'd seen walking through the Grand Caveur during the banquet only two nights before. Nearby, Emerald Le Galaxy, surrounded by his entourage, smiles for paparazzi photos and signs menus for fans. Joining the entrance queue, Torn watches as roughly 15 people ahead of him. Delco Muir hands his personal communication devices over to the theater's security. After being scanned, the administrator nods at his own guards, who remain outside of the building, then smiles at a beautiful socialite, shakes her hand, and walks into the theater with her group. Like Delco, every other person who enters the building hands over their digipads, slivers, earpieces, hollow projectors, and other personal communication devices. Yeah, all right, so Torrance just like sitting there looking around, and he's like, like just staring at all the opulence and looking at himself and feeling a little bit goofy uh, st- uh, in, in the procession of it. And then he just kind of like focuses on Raz. He's like, I don't like crowds. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little daunting. But the other day, I got to stab Cadmus in front of a crowd, not quite this large, but pretty close. Yeah, so walk me through that. How did you get wrapped up in this? Well, everyone was ignoring me, so... I eventually ran into Cadmus and we started talking and he um, he was really cool and he showed me his playhouse and told me that he was he was known to throw on performances every once in a while and that it was sort of a an open performance night and so we we got up on stage and we acted out a scene and I just sort of envisioned uh, a theatrical rendition of um, a brother killing his brother. Well, it was like Cain and Abel. And he's just like, I'm unfamiliar with that story. Oh, it was gnarly. One of them kills the other. I guess for God. Yeah, that's usually how it works, isn't it? And Torn's like rubbing his head, feeling like super awkward that this kid is talking about this kind of stuff with him. Yeah, so Torn kind of like tries to like knee jerk the the um, the conversation back, and he's like, "So what was it like flying with Von Schuth? Because uh, listen, Raz, I've never seen a performance as fantastic as that." Um, it was it was amazing. He he really guided me, and we just worked well together. It was uh, it was almost like we were in sync. And he kept asking me a lot of questions and took in my input. And then if it needed a little tweaking, he like, he changed it slightly, but it was mostly us kind of working harmonious. It was fantastic. Uh, I've never really felt so kind of in tune with anyone. It's always, it's, you know, it's a little awkward for me to get along with people uh, let alone hold conversations for a really long time without people feeling awkward. So <laughs> I just torn chuckles and he's just like, I, I know that feeling all too well, but I think you excel when you put your mind to something and I can't wait to see what, uh, what this looks like tonight with your aid. Oh, I got to, I get to handle a lot of the, the background props and scenes. And if you look over there and Raz points up to the, the lighting system and right under one of the, the like balconies he's like lights pop out of there and lasers shoot out and create whole holographic scenery so the 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 area is not just relying on my paint but it is it has kind of a three-dimensional quality to it so it's really immersive i think you're really gonna love this and And torn has uh with his mind's eye he's like envisioning and he's like I cannot wait to see this. Uh, none of those lasers will burn in holes in anything, correct? <laughs> Not that I know of. But I mean, I guess anything could if you if you put a magnifying glass or to focus it better. And then Torn kind of gets down on his knees, like very swiftly. He's like, Rass, please promise me you're not going to burn a hole in anything. Oh, no, no. I Well... Uh, Raz like starts like like <laughs> frantically trying to backpedal. Like, no, I I don't I don't have control over the lasers. I just have the I did the paintings that are going to make up the backdrops. So I think 
he, he's, he's like he's like uh, he feels very relieved and he's showing in, in every physical way he's like I cannot wait to see your art my kid my guy my my boy <laughs> uh, uh, thanks my dude uh, <laughs> big guy <laughs> and like it doesn't take long for the line to move forward through security once the pair reaches the entrance to the building they hear one of the security officers, a Delphine local woman wearing a nice black dress shirt with a purple and green bow tie, standing amongst two of the local Covindian marshals, say, all, person or all personal audio and recording communication devices in the bin, please. They'll be tagged and returned to you at the end of the show or during intermission when you come speak with us. Torn uh, reluctantly places his comms devices in the whole bin. Um, I have a, so Torn produces a little, a little, uh, gift, something that's, that's seemingly wrapped and, uh, and it feels like soft and squishy. And as he's like pulling it out, he's like deliberately trying to hide it from Raz as he's like placing it into the bin. Ooh. Okay. So upon entering the, does Raz say anything about it or does he, does he let Torn get away with it? I don't think Raz noticed. Okay. <clears throat> Upon entering the grand building, the pair passes through a grand foyer of dark, shining oak pillars with intricate designs of owls running up each. A deep purple carpet runner leads its way through a chandeliered main room that's filled with small circular tables. Everywhere Torn looks, the wealthiest members of USA society drink champagne, laugh, and talk amongst themselves, excited for the show. Nearby, he notices an open bar with a few open spaces available. Across from the bar is a ticketing stand manned by a holographic projection or <clears throat> across the bar is a ticketing stand manned by holographic projections of the cast. What do Torn and Roz do? I anticipated that Torn might be a little anxious because of the communications, so there is an immediate bar inside. Um yeah, I think I think Torn just kind of like looks at it and he, you know his his discomfort with crowds. Torn, uh, Torn will lean down. He's like, Raz, I got you something. Um, it'll have to wait for after the show, um, but break a leg. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, how many? <laughs> um, you you have earned less than one thing. So uh, consider. No, I mean, thing. I mean, how many legs? <laughs> <laughs> I told that went completely over his head. So Torn just starts laughing. Uh, thinking that he was referring to how many gifts uh, Torn had gotten him. And he's like, just as many as it takes to have a good show. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll do my best. And, and then he goes, Ross, you know I don't mean really break anyone's legs, right? Yeah, no, I was joking. Okay. And then he's like, Raz, you're not lying to me that you're joking, right? N no, I was, I was <laughs> totally joking. I won't break any legs. All right, later, Torn. And then he just like Torn like slaps his face and he goes he heads to the bar. I need a drink. <laughs> Torn's first drink goes down fast. After he signals the bartender for another, he hears the voice of Governor Reaching Eye say, One for me as well, please. Thank you. And as he sidles up to the bar next to Torn. Reaching out a hand, the governor shakes Torn's and says, Quite the ornate architecture, wouldn't you say? I can't imagine what the Muir spent on this. I hope the play lives up to the expectations they're selling everyone. I've never been much one for opulence. I always feel like it's distracting from something I should be paying attention to. And he like takes, he like handily pounds his next drink as he looks around. And um, Governor Reaching Eye also does his drink as well. Where's Prince Raz? I, I caught news on the hollow net that about his win with Mr. Van Schuth earlier during the races. It was quite impressive. Who knew the boy Torn, was such, such an adept yeah. pilot? Yeah, Torn lights up and he's like, you know, he said he was he said he was good at this stuff, but until I saw him in that death belt racer, he's like he 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 makes he makes a pilot proud. Let me tell you. And uh, um, reaching, I clinks the glass and he goes to excellence. And then Torn goes, ah, that is one I'll drink too. To excellence. <laughs> And as Roz returns to Torn with the big man's ticket, he sees Governor Reaching Eye standing at the bar with, and the pair sharing a drink. Hi, Mr. Governor Reaching Eye. How are you doing today? Reaching Eye says, Ah, oh, Prince Raz. Hello. It's good to see you. Uh, on behalf of the people of Coral Cove, I wanted to thank you for what you did there yesterday. The, the local boy you spent time there with, uh, Mac, he is my great nephew. 
He told me how you gave him that dragon pearl and how Prince Cadmus stole his oyster underwater when no one was looking. That was a very kind thing of you to do, young man. Oh. Uh, yeah, um, Mac, Mac was awesome. He was really nice. We then went to the, um, did he tell you that? We went to the, um, the, uh, my fucking brain. Smashball. Smashball field after, and he he told me about um about the the greatest player here, um and I knew that I bought it. We got a bunch of merchandise and stuff from the the gift shop, so I could send it to Bobby. And so it was a really fun day, and then him and Calyp- uh him and Cadmus ended up actually getting along pretty well. Uh, it just took a little bit longer. And he's like. It's, he's been talking about the stadium since yesterday. He's been begging me to try to get it reinstated here. And I told him I would do my best. And he kind of like looks over and like sees Delco like mix, mixing, intermingling with like social socialite people. And, and he turns back to Ross and he goes, uh, he asked me to give you this. And from within his robes, the governor pulls out a small red pearl ring that's clearly been carved and polished. In the center of the face of the ring is an R, surrounded by an intricately detailed open oyster. Mac carved it himself with the help of his parents. They wanted to let you know that you were appreciated and that to him and our family, the royals of Odessa will always be welcomed on Dauphine. He, like, hands it to Raz. Thank you so much. This is amazing. And Raz slips it onto his his still living flesh on his his right hand. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And behind the governor, one of his younger aides taps him on the shoulder and says, Sir, looking over his shoulder, reaching out, says, Hmm? I'm sorry to bother you, sir, but you asked me to let you know when Governor Surfingale arrived. She's next in line through security. And the governor nods and says, Thank you. And then turns back to Rosentorn to say, I'm sorry. I I have very little time during these social gatherings. So many people to talk to. Please, I I hope the two of you enjoy the show, and I look forward to seeing the pair of you tomorrow. Excellent. Course, I, I do too. And he kind of like turns, and, to, turns and walks. Didn't off. mean to cut you off. No, you're. Oh. Sorry. And he kind of yeah, turned. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna say after he turns off, like Torn just kind of looks at Raz. He's just like, "You, you are full of surprises." Uh, yeah, I forgot I did that. <laughs> <laughs> so just so everyone is clear, that is not like a magic ring. It is just straight up a pearl ring and. It's like a signature item opportunity type deal. Um, mm-hmm. So passing through the theater, Torn sees that many of the 200 seats have already filled. Passing through the theater, Torn sees that many of the 200 seats have already filled, though people are still slowly filling in and standing in the aisles talking to family and friends. After making their way up onto the side of the stage and past the curtain, the pair enters into the rear and Torn is struck by the absolute chaos of the moment. He's never seen anything quite like it as actors run by shouting about makeup, wigs, wardrobe, and their lines while a handful of stagehands in full-length black leotard bodysuits glue props together, double-check the rigging on the curtains and hide lighting cables that run across the floor. Pushed as far back away from the curtains as they can get, 15 different background slides and movable scene additions have been positioned together. When the pair sees this, an excited Roz rushes towards the collection. Raz, uh, as he's running excitedly over, he's like, "Look at this! This!" Uh, he like he's pointing up slightly above the the stage. Um, this lowers down and it creates a wall. And that those are some swords I helped got I helped carve the other day. Um, there's a big a big war scene and a fight scene in the middle of the uh, the performance at the beginning and towards the end of the performance. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, and Torrance just kind of like taking it all in and like someone rushes by him. He's just he, he's like a little startled because it's almost like he's in some sort of like passive combat. And he's listening to Raz explain all these details. And he's just like, wow, uh, you got yourself involved in something pretty complicated here. Uh, and you're the only one working this this section? No, I don't... no there's a ton of us uh, working back here. I'm just one of the hands. I was helping just develop sets. I'm going to help them move them into position so that the scenes can go go by and shift without anyone noticing us. As Raz starts to like shuck off his his jacket, he's like, "Would you would you hold this for me?" 
and Torn like kind of grabs it like idly because he's like taking it in and he's seeing like other people dressed in complete black just like zip behind Raz and he's, he's just like I, I need to sit down. <laughs> and the tense, panicked voice of Cadmus shouts behind the pair, drawing their attention away from Raz's pieces. Cadmus rushes towards them wearing his full Macbeth ensemble. The boy wears a small headset that projects a holographic image of his own face, aged up to be in his late thirties. Raz, oh, thank shit, you're here. I, hello, Commander. Uh, under Prince. And leaning towards Raz, Cadmus says, um, in- "Anyone not involved in the play isn't supposed to be backstage. W- what's he doing back here?" I mean, he's he's my my bodyguard. I was also just really proud of the work that we were doing, and I wanted to show uh, Torn a bit of a bit of this. And he kind of like looks over at Torn, like side eyes, and he's like, "All right, all right," but he's got to take a seat soon. Oh, of course, he's he, Torn. I think, I think we got to split up. And Torn, uh, Torn kind of like takes a step back with Raz's jacket, and then a, a crowd of the the stagehands kind of like slowly, mo- like quickly moves in front of him. And then as they do that, he you see his hand poke out above like a wave. He's just like break a leg. <laughs> and <clears throat> as Torn walks off, Cadmus leans into to Raz, and he's like. I hate to drop this on you in the last minute, but the actor who was playing on Macduff apparently has stage fright. Seeing the number of people in the theater sent the man off into a rant about how he'd never performed for more than 30. I should have known better than to hire locals, but I know you said you never acted before, but you said you were a good liar, so is there any way you'd be willing to step in for him? Like handing Raz a small, identical headset to the one he's wearing, Cadmus says, the lines are projected on the inside. The audience can't even see them. All you have to do is read it and fake it. What do you say? Um, um, Raz starts like, uh, breathing a little bit and then like takes a deep breath and centers himself. And he's like, I will do this. I will be your Macduff. <laughs> and the end canvas's face just beams. And he's like, perfect. I knew you'd come through. Good man. And he like raises his voice and like shouts to nobody in particular. Get this man into a Macduff costume now. And like at that, two of the black suited stagehands just appear out of the darkness nearby and grab a hold of Roz to like move him forcibly along after Cadmus. Uh, Raz like like trips a little bit, being being shoved forward towards the the changing room. Uh, his entire plan tonight was just to to be moving objects. So now he's like, oh god, well, as long as I don't break anyone's leg, that's what Torn said. But then he did say, as Razzler's just mumbling to himself idly. Um, and so describe Torn finding and taking his seat in the upper royal box seats. And uh, inside the room when he enters is Administrator Muir, the three socialite women he was with earlier, and two of Muir's personal guard. There's also another bar with a waiter. <laughs> All right. Um yeah, so Torn, as he's uh, making his way from the uh, the the backstage, he finds himself um, sticking out far too much in his gleaming suit, um, and he and he starts asking some ushers around. He's just like, "Hey, how do we get? How do I get to the? Is it the ambassador box you called it? Uh, the administrator box." Yeah, he's like, "How do I get to the administrator box from here?" And he's like, the guy like looks at Torn's little holographic thing, and he's like, "You're gonna want to take that left staircase and follow it up to the right." And then take the second left staircase, and then there's going to be a swipe pass. And once you swipe your thing there, it should open up to the location. And then Torn just kind of like nods, and he like walks off, sort of like, um, um, just like confused. And and as he is, ends up on the second staircase, and he ends up at the swipe door, he's like, I think this is it. And he swipes. And like as he swipes it, he hears this. He, he like swipes it, and the first one like he's like, darn darn. <laughs> he's like, oh no! And uh, as a calming, soothing voice like speaks up over the loudspeakers, all within the theater, and he hears it say, "Like, curtains up in five minutes. Audience members, please locate your seating. Thank you." And then like he swipes it again, and it goes ding, and it opens up, it slides to the side. And when Torn enters the room, Delco is leaning against the railing, looking down at all the filling seats. Turning to look at who entered, however, he sees only Torn without Roz or Karina, and raises an eyebrow. Casually drinking the remainder of his bourbon, Delco walks over to Torm with a smile. What can I help you with this good evening, Commander? Is everything all right? He's like, yeah, I think I think this is my seat, and he like prefers his uh, his uh, ticket. Is that so? 
Well, and like Delco's like clearly kind of like, uh, I, I don't want to like share my personal space with just this random security guard. And he, he's like, well, I, I suppose as long as you're quiet, I don't quite mind. Have you ever been to the theater before? Uh, and Torn just kind of like looks down. He's just like, none as beautiful as this, I can say with certainty. Well, you're in for a treat. Tell me, how did the children fare during their adventures across the city today? Anything? And he's, like, he's like, oh, you haven't heard yet. And then he just starts, he just starts railing stories about all the adventures they got through. Tells them about the parachute. Tells them about the death bell races. He's probably like, a, actually, what like as as Torn like rambles excitedly about the kids. What what would uh, Delco? How he, would he respond? To that? His eyes are just kind of like like slowly growing wider, and like he's <laughs> like not stepping away from Torn, but like as the 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 words go, go longer and longer and in more and more and more detail he's like kind of like diagonally like tilting backwards away from Torn. <laughs> yeah and then torn kind of recognizes that and he's like yeah so as you can see quite 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 the adventure he's like well it's quite interesting i don't follow sports myself but that does sound like the spectacle anything to draw more crowds is a good thing right I mean, he's just like, uh, absolutely. And then he's like looking around, like looking at the crowd, realizing that he hasn't seen Karina in a while. Uh, I think we should be expecting Karina here soon. Um, and he just kind of like looks, looks at the seats and he's just like, these are assigned? Yeah. And uh, Torn is, uh, he sees that he's in like the third row in the back, like with other security guards. Oh, okay. So there. Oh, and does he recognize any of them from the beach earlier? Or anything? Uh, he recognizes they're they're Delco's guards. So he's oh, seen them right. before. Yes, but he's actually okay. never interacted with these people. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe upon seeing the security guards and knowing he's ultimately waiting for Karina to get there, um, uh, he's starting to think about how. Wait, how did Rannis intend to get her her ticket? And then he uh, he looks at the security guards and he's just like, uh, "Well, administrator, if it's if it's all the same to you, I think uh, I'll be taking my seat." And he's like, of course, not a problem. And, and as Tor, yeah, oh, you have something? I promise. I was just going to say, Delco walks, like, he's finished his bourbon, so he looks at Torn and he's like, would you like a drink? Uh, oh, yeah. Torn goes, oh, absolutely. Um, get me a, and then he, he, oh, we'll call it the Space Horse, and then uh, whatever that is. And, like, Torn watches as, like, Delco, like, snaps at, like, one of the, like, young socialite women, and he goes, a Space Horse and a bourbon. Make it quick. And, like, she gets up from her seat and like goes and gets it from the bar. Like Torn's just sitting there like, oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, now he already said he wanted to leave and he's just like, um, well, thank you. And he just kind of like stares at him. And he's just like, so. <laughs> <laughs> the door to the, the Royal box opens once again. And this time Calypso walks in followed by officers Damascus and court. The under princess is wearing a gorgeous white, gold, purple, and green dress that fully covers her upper, bo upper body and arms before flowing out into a huge poof around her waist and legs. Ooh. Wow, well, that actually does look like the original character, too. When she sees Torn, a big smile appears on Calypso's face as she moves towards him in a mock hide-and-seek tag motion before saying, What's up, big guy? Where is everyone? And then torn upon immediately seeing her like dives behind the administrator and he's just like, ah, <laughs> great day, great day. And he kind of ignores her question just to, for the greeting, for the greeting's sake. And she stands there just kind of like staring awkwardly at him, super confused. And she just kind of shrugs and she goes, so where's Roz and Karina? Ah, uh, well, yes. Uh, she's under princess then. Is that what we call her? Yeah, under princess. Yeah. Well, under Princess, he steps out from behind the administrator. Um, I, I, I bet their drinks are arriving now, so he, like, grabs it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he's like, Raz is backstage. Uh, he was showing me all of the amazing things he's going to be doing in the show tonight. Um, and I can't wait to see his amazing artwork on display. Karina, uh, she, she's still getting dressed. She'll be here soon. Hmm, good. I was hoping we could all sit up here and whisper about the play together. But if Raz is backstage and Karina's running late... Oh, well, I, I hope at least the actors my brother picked are good. Honestly, sometimes they kind of suck. Hopefully, Ross's <laughs> art will make it better. He's like, I, I, have, uh, I, I, I expect us to be dazzled. And at that, the well, lights... I expect it to be dazzling. I expect it to be bedazzling. Okay. At that, the lights be above begin to dim, and Delco snaps her, his fingers over at his niece, pointing at her to take a seat. 
Looking up to Torn, the red and purple haired 14 year old shrugs and does what she's told to do. And he tries to take his seat where the other security guards are. But is are these normal, like really tight theater seats? Yeah. He's huge. Right, so, he, he's he's right. definitely like it's like an it's like an airplane situation for sure. Yeah, so Torn like tries to get in the row and then he's seeing like the annoyance on all the security guards' faces. And then as he starts to sit, he like he's just like, Oh, I have to do this, I have to do this. And then he, as he starts sitting down, he he watches them all recoil in horror, realizing <laughs> that his ass is just not gonna fit in that seat. And he decides, you know what, I'll I'll I will be standing in the back. Oh. <laughs> um Once everyone except Horn is seated, the curtains open, revealing a stage empty of people. But there, lined in the back, are three of of the walls that Ross painted. Over the theater speakers, Torn hears the voice of Cadmus say, Act one, scene one, a desert place. And like Calypso looks over her shoulder back at Torn and smiles, scrunching up her nose and mouthing the words, Here we go. Delco shoots the girl a look, and she rolls her eyes, but looks back to the stage as simulated thunder and lightning cascades now throughout the theater as three approaching witches make their presence known to the audience. So, 6.36 p.m. Each step sends a surge of pain up from Grizz's left hip into his lower back as the 38-year-old mechanic, chef, renaissance man, limps his way across the Yorami spaceport tarmac towards the roving dawn. Burnt orange light from the evening's red-setting sun reflects off the shining gold of the ship's hull, reflecting an image of Grizz back towards himself when he gets close enough. Pausing outside the ship's closed cargo bay door, Grizz stares at himself. His hair is disheveled, he's got a black eye, his lip is split, and there's dried blood around his mouth. His shirt is ripped badly and dangles off his left shoulder, and one of his shoes is missing. Grizz looks at his reflection in the ship and he says, we've got to stop meeting like this. Reaching into his pockets, Grizz remembers that the wallet containing his digicard and identichip was taken by Bert, Dale, and Shane. The memories of their pummeling blows and violent kicks swarms back into his mind as the entire left side of his ribcage starts to throb. Grizz sort of knocks lightly at first on the cargo bay door and then he kind of gets like annoyed because no one's responding and he bangs a little harder and then he turns around like backwards and just starts like kicking it with his foot trying to get her attention. After a few minutes the huge door opens and Grizz sees Ibioff standing next to the floating tiny disc of Ares. The small robot projects an initial green smiling face at Grizz before switching to one of Eek! before scanning him. Ibioff steps forward, saying, What happened to you? Are we under attack? I've already didn't lock the weapon storage. What's going on? Where are the others? Are, are the others safe? Like reaching an arm up under Grizz's, the mechanic helps him into the ship. Ah, uh, nothing. I just got into some shit. I don't know where everybody else is. What? Wait. This, this happened to you alone? This, you got into a fight with locals? Oh, yeah. I fly solo most of the time. Oh, okay, good. I, I was panicking. Whew, okay. Ah, well, you, you look like shit. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, you look great, too. Come on, I, I, I'll get you cleaned up. Let's go. And once they're inside, Ibiav closes the doorway and leads Grizz up the stairs to the ship's main floor. Passing briefly through the gallery, the pair enters the ship's medical bay and Ibiov helps Grizz lean against the auto dock as she opens a nearby cabinet and pulls out a singular lo- singular use med kit to hand to him. Here you go. That's about the extent I can help. Who are these men that did this to you? I don't know, man. Just some redneck hicks. Uh, first off, do not call me man. Have some respect. And secondly, why did this encounter occur? Did you provoke them in some way? No, man. They just wanted to rob me. Sorry. Sorry. Maybe I was like, I would smack you if your eyes were not so black. Be careful with your next words, Grizz. I'm like, floating in the air next to Grizz, Ares scans his body and projects a small holographic image of the man's in, like internal readings into the air. 
They state that Grizz has a concussion and some internal bruising, but that he has no broken bones. Grizz roll medical aid. All right. So as Grizz uses this um, med kit, he begins to tremble because he's pretty fucked up. And all of his skill rolls using agility will suffer a minus two until the panic ends. And while he's like putting that cream on, Ibiov's just kind of standing there watching him. Should I be concerned about this situation? Are you planning on seeking these men out for an attempt at retribution? No, what in the hell would be the point of that? They beat the dog shit out of me. And she's like, good to know. And a sudden, like, badeep from Ares draws the attention of both mechanics. The holographic image of Grizz's medical chart d disappears, replaced instead by security footage from the ship's exterior hull. Three people stand outside the ship. Ibiov recognizes two of the three as Dash's mother and brother, but doesn't recognize the older man with them. It's clear that Dash's mother is yelling and pounding on the hull of the cargo door while her brother looks around the area, and the unknown man stands there with his hands on his hips nervously. And Ibiov says, Ares, initiate external Nemeus Odeo. And suddenly Vivian's voice spills into the room around the pair. She's clearly upset and she's shouting, I saw you closing the door. I know someone's in there. Answer me. Answer me, God damn it. And Ibi, I was like, Ares, exterior audio off. And like Vivian's pounding and shouting goes back to silent as she asks, Have you seen Medic Dash at all since she left for her vacation? No, not once. And she like points to the feed and she goes, This woman is her mother. The younger of the two men is her brother. I'm guessing the older one is her father. And she brought the mother and brother and an elderly woman here yesterday. She'd been looking into an illness her husband's grandmother is afflicted with. Uh, something with parasites, I don't know. She didn't tell me. Ares, exterior audio on. And Vivian's like, Please, answer me! I don't know who else to talk to, you Odessans! You love this world, right? You love its people? Something's wrong here. Very wrong. My daughter is in danger. My family. We need you. If Odessa ever really cared, please open this door. And she's like pounding on it. And like looking back at Grizz, Ibiav says, I'm, I'm going to let them in. There is something in her voice that unnerves me. Hey, man, I just work here. If you think that's the right thing to do, go ahead. Aries. Open the cargo bay doors. And like the pair watches, Dash's family rushes into the now open cargo bay. Once they're safely inside, Ibiav says, Iris, close the cargo bay doors. On the interior security footage projected by Ares, Grizz and Ibiav watch as Vivian dashing sight takes the ship's stairs two at a time. Her husband and son keep pace behind her. Turning away from Grizz, Ibiav walks out of the med bay with Ares in tow into the galley to intercept the approaching trio. When Vivian sees Ibiav, she's like, Where's my daughter? Like straightening her back at the woman's raised voice, Ibiav says, First off, this is not your ship. Do not raise your voice to me, mother of Medic Dash. I can see that you're stressed out. I have not seen Veronica since the group of you left yesterday. And like motioning back through the open bulkhead doors of the medical bay towards Grizz, Ibiav says, Neither has our cook. And when everyone turns to look at Grizz, Cody winces at the sight. At first, Veronica asks Ibiav, What happened to him? But before Ibiav can respond, Veronica walks past Ibiav into the medical bay and asks Grizz directly, What happened to you? Well, I got robbed. A bunch of guys beat the shit out of me. Ibiav says, It was a disagreement with tourists. None of us know where your daughter is. Now please, explain why you've shown up here in such a, taste of, uh, in such a state of distress. My patience with this situation is beginning to grow thin. Like stepping up, Dash's father puts his hands out in a calming, downward motion. Everyone needs to bring it down a notch, okay? We're not going to solve anything by panicking. Like reaching out his hand, hand towards Ibiov, then to Grizz, he says, My name's Adam. Veronica's my daughter. You've already met my wife Vivian and son Cody. And both Ibiov and Grizz notice that unlike the tan skin and black hair of Dash, 
her mother and Adam's brother, Adam's skin is pale, and just like Dash, his pupils are silver. Veronica's husband, Oscar, his grandmother, Ed, has been living with us for the last year since she's been getting up there in age. Uh, three months ago, she started having heart problems. Our local doctors couldn't do anything about it, so they referred her to a specialist here in Resort of Fina. A doctor by the name of... Like Vivian briefly cuts her husband off to say, Georgina Feigl. Adam nods. R right. So the meds that Dr. Feigl put Adam on did wonders. It was like a miracle almost, but... Last month or so, she's been even better than she was before she moved in with us. Uh, like she lost a decade of age. And like shaking his head, Cody goes, hey, it, was, it was awesome. And Adam continues, When Veronica made landfall in Farshore and found out about the illness, she wanted to look, in, look into it herself. Talked a whole storm up about all the technology Odessa provided her with for this royal tour you all are on. And like speaking up, Vivian says, That was yesterday. We stopped in here so Veronica could scan Ada with that machine over there. Like Vivian points to the Instadoc. Or whatever she saw in the diagnostics, sh she wouldn't say, but... I've only seen my daughter scared in this life three times, and that was one of them. Before we left, Veronica confiscated the medicine prescribed by Dr. Feichel and put Ada on an antiparasitic. Everything was fine until earlier today when she had a seizure. She was... But she was bleeding, bleeding from her nose and her mouth, and... And when it was happening, I called V, and she looked terrified and had tears in her eyes, like she already knew. She hung up on me. Within seconds, I was breathing again, like, stopped bleeding, and she was able to stand like nothing had just, nothing had even happened. And Oh, God. Veronica called me with tears in her eyes, asking if Ada was okay. She told me to keep her safe, and... And that she'd be home in just a bit, but that, an hour later, a squad of Covindy Marines showed up on Far Shore and they took her. They just took Ada away in this ugly fucking purple ship. Veronica won't answer my comms. I don't know where either of them is or what's going on, and we don't know anyone else who can help. So please, help. Grizz sort of looks at his feet for a second because he's thinking. So the military took her away. Mm -hmm. Do they know where? No, they're, that's, they're, they're here asking for help to find him. Like, Dash is missing and the military took the grandma away. Chris sort of looks at Ibiov. He's like, is there any way we can track her down? I don't know. Uh, we should be able to. Uh, Ibiov, like, taps into her comm unit and she goes, Commander Dorn, come in. This is Mechanic Storlov requesting your presence. There's no response. Tapping the <laughs> <laughs> Tapping the comm button again, Ibiov says, Prince Rawls, come in. Once again, there's no response. Trying a third time, Ibiov says, Princess Karina, please respond. Trying to hide the concern in her face, Ibiov looks over to Grizz as the comms remain silent. Growing concerned, Vivian says, What does that mean? Nobody on your team's answering? <laughs> Miss Starlov, what's that mean? And Ibiov's like, mm, Follow me. Ibiov leaves the med bay, walking through the galley into the ship's bridge, followed by Vivian, Adam, and Cody. Grizz kind of has like a bad feeling in his gut, so he goes to his quarters and he tries to find something like a, not like a wetsuit, but like something snug, like <laughs> that he can attach like stuff to, like tools and things. Like a, like a, like his mechanic jumpsuit? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Inside the bridge, Ibiav taps a few buttons on one of the security consoles and pulls up a holographic projection of scans taken by the colony as the ship, or by the Rubbing Dawn as they approached. Each of the crew members is designated a small icon showing their name. The icons for Grizz and Ibiav show that they're at the spaceport, or the icons for Torn and Raz show that they're in the entertainment district of Yorami. Karina is six miles out in the middle of the ocean, and Dash doesn't exist. Stepping up closer to the projected image, Vivian looks from designator to designator. Her name should be listed on here. Sh shouldn't it? But it's not, he it's not here. So how do we find her? What do we do? I'm like punching her closed fist down as hard as she can on the metal console, Vivian shouts, Where did they take my daughter? And like 7.06 p.m. Cold bloody salt water 
fills into the once secure interior of the small 10 person sized submersible pod. Wearing only Dash's leather jacket, Ada rocks back and forth in the passenger seat, cradling a screaming newborn baby. The jacket is oversized on the small, elderly woman, but her bare feet and legs up to the knees are in water. Around the pod are 11 other children, ranging from eight years old down to other infants, like the one she's holding. All of the children are crying, some are shaking, and some simply stare out of the pod's windows to the black clouds above, spilling their torrential downpour of rain and lightning onto the choppy ocean waves around them. In the center of the partially water-filled pod is the body of Veronica Dashing Star, and it floats face down in the bloody water, unmoving. The medic's shirt has been ripped to pieces and covered in so many splotches of blood that they've all fused together from water seepage. <sighs> Through tears, Ada stares down at Dash's body and strokes the baby's head, whispering, Shh, shh, it's okay. It's gonna be okay. What does Dash say and or do when she lifts her head up out of the water? She comes up kind of gasping for breath and, uh, she says, Anna, I don't think I can fix it. That damn shark did too much. What do we, what do, we do? She takes a couple of studying breaths. We got to figure out a way to, to get to the closest rig as fast as we can. Whoa. And like you guys can kind of see that and like, you know, as lightning crashes that like the rig is maybe you know, six, seven hundred yards through choppy water. And speaking up from behind her seat, or speaking up from behind Dash's seat, six-year-old Stresha Colmore with a deeply panic-stricken face shouts, No! We can't go back there! Please don't take us back there! That's where the bad men are! And some of the other children begin to spiral emotionally at the young girl's words. Uh, Dash turns to the little girl and she's she's kind of panicking herself because she doesn't know what to do with children, um, especially children that are distraught. And so she, she asks her, what, "What do you what do you mean these bad men? I thought I thought you guys were were happy in the facility." The, the ones you the ones you the ones you sh that you shot that you you saved us from. What if what if there's more? Oh, honey, don't worry about them. I'll take care of them if they become a problem again. Don't you worry yourself. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so she is going to continue to channel like all of the great pilots that she's learned from and her dad and, and everything she learned growing up. And um, she's pretty much willing the pot at this point to make it to the rig. Yeah. Roll piloting. Okay. Roll that panic. <laughs> oh gosh. Please be low. <laughs> For the love of God, please be low. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I so like as she's trembling, describe the process Dash goes through in piloting this slowly sub sinking submersible pod over to the rig into this like open freight elevator that is itself partially underwater. Um, so she's just going to try her hardest to uh, keep steady while she maneuvers this pod back up to the surface. Once the sub arrives and it reaches the freight elevator, the water inside is like up to Dash's chest. And many of the children are treading water and like the deep grinding scrape of the metal of the exterior hull crashing and sliding across the elevator's floor vibrates and shakes the pod, bringing out louder screams for the children. Attempting to reassure them, Ada says, We're all all right. It's okay. We're here. We're here. She did it. And she like looks over at Dash, and she's like, You did it. And like just the twin under or just like the twin underwater scientific facilities that had both only recently imploded, the rig has no power. Even though they've successfully made it onto the platform, Dash knows that she has no way of raising it. Roll observation. 
Oh shit. You trying to fucking push it? <laughs> uh, I've only got one stress left, so yeah, why not? <laughs> Fuck it. Roll that panic. Cool, cool. Cool. All, All right. right. All right. So she freezes upon reeling, realizing that, um, you know, this elevator is not going to fucking raise. And fucking Ada's like, Veronica, or Veronica, honey, can you hear me? Are you there? Listen to my voice. Are you with me? I'm like, Dash kind of, what does she say? Nothing. She doesn't respond. <laughs> And when Ada sees that she's just like frozen in fear, she goes, listen to me, sweetheart. Nobody chooses this life, okay? We're all going to die in the end. It's in our worst moments that we find the most definition. You have to choose here and now what kind of person you're going to be. What you're going to stand for. Believe in yourself. I do. You've gotten us this far. Your family does. Oscar does. And like in that moment, Dash's fear is broken. And she is no longer frozen. <laughs> Having done underwater training for her battalion with the USAW years before, Dash has traversed rigs similar to this one and knows that there's an individual ladder leading up from the elevator that will unlock from within the cage running up alongside the rig once the elevator door has been manually closed and locked. The water within the sub has stopped rising since the pot is on safe ground and no longer sinking. All right, guys. I gotta go out there and get this gate closed. Otherwise, we ain't gonna make it up there. And Stress is like, you, you're leaving us? No, you can't, you can't. And like reaching out uh, to rub a hand gently on Stress's cheek, Ada's like, don't worry, dear, she won't be gone long. Like this act barely placates Stresser, who looks at Dash and she's like, uh, oh, be careful. And Stress throws her arms around Dash's waist and squeezes her as hard as she can. Please. Uh, Dash is kind of caught off guard uh, with this little girl hugging her. But after a second, she kind of hugs her back and um, she thinks back to like her childhood and how Ada would comfort her on some of her hardest days. And um, she pulls out one of the affirmations and whispers it to Stretch and she goes, you are brave, you are strong, you are resilient. I'll be back. Okay. She turns to Ada and says, Ada, keep these kids safe while I'm gone. I'll be back as soon as I can. You would think at this point she would just be like dead, but it's like adrenaline wave after adrenaline wave keeps like hitting her. Um, so she's able to muscle this hatch open pretty easily and she makes sure to close it behind her as she climbs up this ladder. And when she's out in the water, roll observation. Okay. So, um, before we do anything, roll your empathy. Just hit the empathy. The word empathy. Empathy. Oh, no. Don't worry about the panics. Okay. But Dash just gained a permanent mental trauma. Oh, good. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> hey, welcome to alcoholism. Oh, so cool. Dash. That fits. Yeah. Dash must now uh not immediately. It's not taking place tonight, but in the future she will be coming an alcoholic and she has to drink alcohol every 8 hours or her stress level will increase by 1. She cannot relieve stress without drinking alcohol. That's yeah, she was kind of headed that way anyway, so this, this tracks, yep. this tracks. So the reason why she flees is because as she's moving through the water in this freight elevator, and it's like choppy, it's like, you know, shifting back and forth, it's pulling her like a couple, you know, inches here, here and there, she sees the fin of Hank very, very fucking quickly, just like, <laughs> like coming at her fucking like a rocket, just like tearing through the water towards her ass, roll initiative. Oh gosh, fucking Hank! Great, look at his face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you lucky! <laughs> you lucky! All right. Yeah, I guess she has the pod in between 
her and Hank. And she's actually going to get the drop on him by, by provoking him to like turn away from the pro the, the pod okay. to focus more on her. She kind of slaps the water and just says, Hey, Hank over here. I'm what you want. So she's going to aim for Hank and, uh, she's going to try and, and, and shoot him. Can she see his head yet? Is he she can enough? see his fin and like his sort of like how the water's moving around his body as he's like beginning to open his mouth up, like getting like pretty close. He's maybe like thirty feet from her coming in pretty hot. Okay. All right. So she is gonna aim. So altogether it'd be a plus four, right? Is it a bonus plus two? Uh no, bonus plus one. Okay, so three. Okay. Okay, roll your panic. He got, oh, well, fuck yeah. All right. All right, yeah, um, roll your empathy again. <laughs> she's just, like, oh, screaming God. as this fucking shark who, oh, she's already fought. All right, ignore that panic. Roll a d6. Fuck. Oh, she's just, like, really an alcoholic. You're lucky. That was two again. Okay, so, yeah, describe... What happens, she does enough damage to cause him to fucking turn away. I mean, she she just lays into him. She's she's over it at this point. She's hot enough with this damn shark. Um, so she just unloads right into him. And she watches as like the bullets are just like just like tearing through the water and she sees the blood like come out of the water and like all of the like white filling the wounds and he just like fucking whips around the pod and like kinda like swishes his tail at her, but like misses and like heads back out into the water giving her fucking time to basically run over to this just massive sort of like lever that she has to fucking just be like and like she turns it and the whole fucking just metal elevator like f door just like collides and like blocks the uh the rest of the ocean off you're still partially underwater but you and the pod and everybody are safe and with the like heavy like gur, 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 like um, alerts that the gate has come down and, and as as Dash looks through the gate of the small platform out into the rocking like waving ocean, she can't see more than thrashing waves and like strikes of lightning. Like dropping her head briefly underwater, she takes a second look through the grating to see that only inches on the other side of the gate is the face of Hank. The small animal shark stares directly at her, grinning. But unable to reach her. As she rises back up out of the water, a cold, painful realization dawns within Veronica's mind that only some of the children will be able to make the climb up this ladder without help, and that she's going to have to leave Ada down here in the freight so she can take multiple trips to carry the, the babies. Uh, so she takes several deep breaths before climbing back down into the pod, and she's just, she's very plain about what needs to happen and it's just like what was the what was the gunfire like uh. oh don't you worry baby i was just taking care of things okay. now i need you guys to to be big girls and boys we got a ladder we need to climb and ad is going to help the babies but i need you all to 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 muster every bit of strength you got so you can get up here and like they're all kind of looking through the the front glass of the um, the window of the pod, and and stress is like, you you want us to climb that? I, we can't do that. That's too tall. You you can do it. Just trust in yourself. You'd be amazed at the things you can do. And Ada like looks down at this little girl, and she's like, my dear, with patience and calm, even a donkey can climb a tree. One foot in front of the other. Like one of the older children puts a hand on Shush's shoulder and is like, yeah, I'll, I'll be right right there behind you. You can do this. I won't let you fall. And Ada's like, good guys, come on. Yeah, everyone out. All of the kids kind of like follow Dash out of the sub. And Ada's out in there and she's, you know, holding the baby and like the three oldest uh, kids hang back and they're holding the babies as well just to, to uh, roll a panic. Okay, <laughs> so Dash leaves the kids behind and climbs up the ladder first, of course, to make sure that like everything's going to be safe. 
And when she gets to the top of the ladder, she sees that, like, they're on a salt trawler rig. And that in the distance, there's a group of Coventon soldiers illuminated in, like, a shock of lightning. And they, like, run out of sight without seeing her. Like, she climbs back down. Does she say anything to the kids, or does she just kind of, like, get them sort of moving back up? Uh, she just ushers them to, to, to move up. Okay. So, like, once they're sort of all up at the top of the platform, Dash is exhausted. She's weak. She's looking at these weary faces of these kids and just can't imagine how they're feeling right now. And to her left, she notices, like, this covered but open engineering mechanical bay. And, like, the six children follow after Dash. She motions for them to keep up. Upon entering into the dark shade of the bay, Dash situates the kids safely behind a powered-down refinery tub. All right, guys. I need you to keep being brave. Just stay here and be quiet. Stay hidden. And, like, they're nodding, like, we can do that. And one of them's like, you're coming back for us, right? You're not going to leave us here? Of course I'm coming back for y'all. Okay. We can be quiet. We can be quiet. And, like, they're all just kind of, like, crouching down, like, in this corner behind all of these, like, toolboxes, like, big rolling toolboxes. And, you know, it's Mechanics Bay. 7, 10 p.m. Standing alone in the dark bathroom to the rig's office trailer. Karina holds her hands above her head and stares out of her cracked, partially shattered helmet at the man who's approached her, who's just approached her, saying that he's a friend. What does Karina do? I'm sorry, what's your name? <sighs> uh, it's Oscar. Uh, my wife's Veronica. Uh, she works on the ship with you. Your, your Oscar? Uh, yeah, I work here. I run, I run one of the salt rigs. Uh, Princess, I don't want to pry, but this is kind of a weird situation. So I'm gonna ask, what the hell are you doing out here, and why are you wearing that? She's gonna take a second because she doesn't really know how to answer that question. Because she's asking herself basically the same thing. So, thinking that the most reasonable explanation might be closest to the, you know, the truth, she's going to say, well, someone tried to kill me tonight, and they, you know, dumped me in the ocean, and now I'm here. He looks at her, and he's like, I I'm, I'm sorry, you, you said something. Somebody tried to kill you tonight? How, how does that lead to you being on a salt rig in the middle of the ocean? Yeah, like I said, I someone, I, I don't know who, someone grabbed me, I guess. I was on my way to meet someone, you know, between plans that I had. And this, I, I, you know, we're, I have this suit which it was a mistake for them to, to leave it on me and it kept me alive, but I was just dumped out here. And the, this trawler was the closest thing that I could find. Uh, you know why the power went down or why the soldiers are all massing together out there? Well, no. Mm. There's soldiers here? Roll a uh, manipulation. <laughs> Are you joking? Is it a goddamn joke? Oh man, well, you know the game. The game uh, requires its its fee. Oh, she lied. Play. She lied, and the game was like smack. Um, I, what the fuck was I supposed to? Do? Oscar, Oscar's like, uh, princess. I saw you run and hide from the soldiers. That's why I came in here after you. Um, so she keeps it together, and she starts trembling and twitching when he says that. And she freezes. Yeah. Because that was four, right? So how many is that? Stress level goes up. Stress level goes up. Um, Got a minus two it. on agility. And then it goes up mm -hmm. again. So she, she just went up two points. So she should be up at two. nine right now, yeah. Yeah. 
and then I'll just have to remember the agility minus two. Yeah, so she's like uh, frozen, and he sees that. He sees that she's frozen, and like trembling and shaking, and like unable to respond to him. And he kind of like steps forward, and he puts his hands out on our shoulders, and he goes, "All right, calm down. Everything's gonna be okay. Tell me what happened. Take a seat here. Sit down." And he like helps Karina like sit down on like one of these like rolly office chairs. And he goes, "Breathe. Walk me through it. What is going on?" Okay, yeah, she can't even pretend to lie because obviously she's having a nervous breakdown. So she'll try to breathe amongst her twitching, trembling, and being frozen. And she'll say, okay, that whole thing wasn't a lie. I was dumped out here. But when I made it into... Did you know that this place has an underground lab? What? An underground? No. There's people being experimented on. And I felt the overwhelming need to intervene. So that explosion was me. And he kind of like takes a step back and he's like, wait, wait a minute. So hold on. There's 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 a secret rig underneath this one and they're experimenting on people and you blew it up. I thought you were I thought you were like a fairy tale princess. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um shit. Wait a minute. Does V know you're here? Is she involved in this? Is she in danger? I haven't seen her since we got here. I have no idea where she is. Oh. She said she was visiting family. She, she's you. You don't know where she is. No, the last time I saw her was yesterday on y'all's ship. My grandma's been sick, and she was looking into it. Corporate here on the rig locks all of our communication devices up when our shifts start. They say it's to keep us focused, but I mean, I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been off grid all day worrying about her. All of a sudden, power goes out, and you show up, looking like you got pushed through a meat grinder, talking about people trying to kill you. I mean, are you all right? By the way, they. They keep a medical kit in here in case of work-related injuries. I think I can find it. One sec. V showed me a few things the last time she visited. And, like, he's clearly looking at, like, her exploded robotic ear and, like, the charring around it. And, yep. like, the bullet holes in her side. And yeah, she's still actively bleeding, I would guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. And what does Karina say and or do after being sort of bombarded by, like, Oscar and her own feelings? And like watching as he starts like looking around the office frantically through drawers and office cabinets for a medical kit. Well, I think, you know, being in a situation where like the body is kind of going to be the one who's taking her body is going to be the one who's taking the reins. And because this feels safer than how she's felt in hours, I would guess it's been hours. Um, she kind of can't help but feel like all of the adrenaline just kind of starts like leaving and she just kind of like tries to relax or she doesn't try to relax. She physically like relaxes because she can't keep herself tense anymore, mm -hmm. especially knowing that he is looking for medication to or medical kit to help her. Mm -hmm. And all of her limbs just kind of get really heavy and she's trying her best to stay focused, but kind of like the edges of her vision are blurring a little bit and she hears him she, he's like ah oh, here it is all right come sit down or or he, he's he's like all right i'll be right there and he comes in and he like pulls a chair over and he goes your ear oh shit you, you know your ear was missing <laughs> yeah it's been missing for a while but i guess the implant the implant couldn't stand up to the water pressure yeah it looks like it exploded but I think I can clean it up a bit. Are you hurt anywhere else? Uh, and she'll like motion to the bullet holes. It's like, right. I don't know exactly where she was shot. I think probably like the shoulder. No, nah, it was her side. Cause she did. Cause the, they lit her up as she dived over that railing. Okay. So yeah, like she'll motion to that, to those as well. And he's like, all right, I, I'm going to get, I'm going to get to this in one second. I, I just look, I'm not alone here. Every shift is 40 men, and most of them don't know you're here, but three of my buddies are outside keeping watch for soldiers. I've known them my whole life. They can be trusted. 
Now that I know it's you and what's going on, I'm gonna bring him in. Okay, don't don't shoot him. Okay. And like he walks over towards the doorway, and Oscar peeks his head out to make sure nobody's around before saying, "Simon, Cord, Bernard, it's clear you guys get in here." Like moments pass before three men wearing the same jumpsuit as Oscar enter the room with them. They're all middle-aged, like Oscar, and give Karina a weak smile, nod, or small hand wave as they enter. A heavy-set balding man named Cord says. Ah, uh, princess. And like shoving past his friends, Oscar says, "Watch out, guys! I gotta, I gotta help her get patched up." And Simon says, mm, is "She, uh, did she tell you what's going on?" Like while patching up Karina's ear, Oscar's like, "Simon, she's a teenager, not an animal. Ask her yourself." Like what does Karina say? Is like the armor sort of like slides away, like from her chest and shoulders to like sort of like extend back into the the concealment so he can get at the bullets. And Oscar's like, "Oh my god." Uh, shit, honey, honey, you've been shot. Yeah, that's not surprising. And he looks over at his buddies and he's like, hey, clear off that table. And they all like kind of move everything off like the office table and like Karina, like, he's like, lay down. Yeah, she'll, she'll try to, you know, hop up there. And or I guess if it's a, like a desk. Yeah, it's just like a desk. Yeah. yeah. So go ahead and uh, like describe how Oscar cleans up the wound over her exploded robotic ear and then injects Metagel into the bullet holes in her side. Yeah, so he's going to have to... I would guess he's probably going to have to try to find if there's like a water bottle or something around because the wound would have been still bleeding. And even though she's been in and out of the water, I her hair has got to be a complete mess. So he's going to have to like kind of rinse the side of her face off and oh it's injections that's gonna be terrible so yeah he's gonna have to i guess he's it's gonna be in like four points around where her ear was because it's like a numbing agent um and so it's like north south east west like basically around her ear and if he can, he's the only way to really like cover it is going to have to be to take a rag and kind of wrap it around her, the side of her head. Yeah. And, <laughs> and when she winces, he's like, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah. So it'll go from, it'll go from like around her head, like down her chin up over the top, like the crown of her head. So she is just like, <laughs> how did this happen? I guess the f closest thing to her mind might be that she does need to get in contact with like someone because nobody knows anything. And now she knows that, or she suspects, slash she knows that the Covindans are doing things that Vasily definitely would not approve of. So she's trying to figure out A, she's in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, dude. B, the the electricity is down. Mm -hmm. So she's going to have to try to figure out if there's any kind of comm system that she can use. And so I guess she would ask Oscar about that. And then C, she's just like still, she's just in shock. She's completely, like, her body, she can't, especially because now that she's getting medical care, it's going to be really hard for her to, like, get back up and keep going. Yes. Um, he does give her an adrenaline shot, and he's like, go ahead and inject this whenever you're ready. Um, <laughs> and uh, so what does she say then? She, she, you said you wanted, she wanted to ask him about communications. Like, what does she say specifically, though? You said that they keep your, your comms in a locker. Do your comms work out here? If I can find some, if I can find this a, a way to communicate with my people, I might be able to get us help. And Oscar's like, well, yeah, I mean, all our personal, they're, yeah, they're, they're up in the, um, they're up in the office. Like we might be able to get you there. I mean, the lounge isn't that far. It's a short walk, flight of stairs, secondary offices. We, I mean, with the soldiers out there though, it's going to be a problem. And like Bernard's like, I mean, well, that suit, I mean, shit, she looks like she can handle herself, Oz. I'm like, turning to look at his friend, Oscar's like, I'm not sending her off alone, Bernard. If you guys want to stay here, I decide I don't blame you, but I'm going. Besides, i got a smash ball in my locker. It's not a gun, but it's something. 
I'll pick it up. I'll pick it up along with the the the, the comm devices. The three men look amongst each other before Cord says, "Nah, we're with you." Turning to look at a turning to look at uh, Karina, he says, "Odessa is strong." Odessa is strong, particularly with Dauphine. Let's roll your medical aid plus two because he ooh, used. Ooh. Uh, yeah, I know you need it. How many hit points do you have right now? One. One. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking so lucky. Woo! Okay, first roll your panic, but one, two, three, four, five fucking hit points. No! <laughs> five fucking hit points back. Um. Okay. <laughs> roll your empathy. God damn it! <laughs> oh, that's the luckiest one. A phobia. That's- you just got a phobia. So. Karina now has a fear of something. You are terrified by something related to what caused your panic. And the the panic um, was fucking basically being injected by needles, which makes oh. sense considering what she just fucking went through. This game, yeah, was. This yeah. game is so cool. Um, I had three... Oh, God damn it. Okay. Your stress level will always increase whenever you are around needles. Are you? Tr- yes. Okay. If you stay close to the needle for more than a single round, you are forced to make a panic roll. Oh, my God. So okay. she, she's, like, afraid of fucking doctors and shit now. Whew. This is getting That's cool. cool. Yeah, That's cool. I've never cool. heard of that mechanic before. That's awesome. Yeah, no one's a rolled a phobia. This is the first phobia of the game. Great. Every, oh, it's, it's an honor. <laughs> everyone's rolled like nightmares, alcohol, drug use. Um, all right, so <laughs> roll your mobility. My mobility. Okay. Yeah, to sneak across this fucking rig here. Oh my god. I don't. <laughs> roll em. Okay. So the reason why she freezes and seeks cover. Makes sense because crouch. So as they're, as she's sort of leading them through Karina, like sees a group of six soldiers sort of walking with a woman that she recognizes to be Dr. Feichel. So uh, she's on the freaking rig. She is on the rig. Yes, she is on the rig. She is on the rig. She would have made a bigger effort downstairs you should have made a bigger effort downstairs yes <laughs> you didn't you didn't sufficiently fuck the place up enough no I didn't know you were pretty hard on that shit dude crouching at the corner of a massive metal a di- uh, massive metal distillation vat karina peeks around to see a group of six purple and green armed soldiers protecting georgina feichel the black and white haired geneticist walks across the rig towards a staircase that wraps around the rigs t- that that leads to a um that leads to a catwalk that stretches o- across the colony toward or across the rig towards a central tower but she stops and yells into her phone her face is furious get your goddamn house in order delco i told you not to trust her i told you the royals weren't here for vacation i told you they were up to no good N- no the children, the boy and the girl, they're not what you think they are. But you didn't want to listen, did you? No! Well, you listen to me now, you little dick fuck. We lost tens of billions of dollars tonight because I v- uh, <clears throat> because of your mistake. This is on you to fix it, do you hear me? No! Dash! Get your fucking military out here now. I don't give a good single fuck that there's a storm. The quietus is loose. Do you hear me, Delco? It's loose. Send me a fucking transport now. After ending the comms, Dr. Feichel closes her eyes and reaches up to rub both temples before turning to one of the soldiers to say, Each of you take a water pack and a diving suit. Get down in the water and search the wreckage. You're looking for a local woman, shoulder-length black hair, wearing a black leather jacket. I want her found dead or alive and brought to me. Let the others know as well. Is this clear? And the leader of the military unit nods, yes, ma'am, before turning to the rest of the squads to say, Owls 03 and 04, you're f- z- uh, Owls 0345, you're with me. We're going under. One, two, stick with the doctor. Don't let her out of your sight. Meet up with Shadow Squad. Each of the soldiers responded kind and split off. 
three rushing out of sight to go dive, while Dr. Feichel and the other three head in the opposite direction. She shouts to them, If you're accompanying me, keep pace, please, gentlemen. And like they all sort of head off. When they kind of walk off, Oscar looks over at Karina and he goes, who the, who the hell is that? She's leading the... She's the leader of their, their underground experiments. Underwater experiments. Did you? Did she mention Dash? She did. She said something about her. That she caused problems. She cost them billions of dollars in research. Who, that, uh... She, I think she, she, she was talking to the administrator. Oh, God. She thinks Dash did this? She, she said Delco. She was talking to Administrator Muir about Dash. <laughs> or about Veronica. Okay. It's not good that they're on their way. Put them we need the comms first, though. They are going to do the, like, one by one. One person runs, hides behind some crates, hides behind some some of these big boxes of salt. Just kind of, like, one at a time, trying to be really sneaky. Karina has reactivated her stealth setting on her suit. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so when she, when they get there, it's just kind of like a pretty threadbare, you know, that you can tell that they're not really invested in their employees' well-being because it's supposed to be an employee lounge, but it's just kind of like there's one, like, sad brown couch that has stains Aww. on And, like, there's lockers. And there's a coffee pot, and it, you can tell that the coffee has been in there for a while. And there might be like one little screen for people to watch, like a little hollow projector thing. Yeah, but it's not. It's like the equivalent in this time period of of like those old kitchen TVs that ha- that were like, you know, two feet thick. And we're just yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, like, once they're inside, Oscar rushes over to his locker, opens it, pulls out a digipad, turns it on, and tosses it to Karina. Hopefully, this can reach through the storm. Once she's caught it, he turns his attention back to the locker to pull out a green smash ball. I guess the first person she would try to call would be Dash because she just think she just heard what she believes sounded like Dash being blamed for what Karina did. Mm-hmm. That's what it sounded like to her. So she's like, well, f- <laughs> that's not good. Got a Warren Dash. Don't know where she is. How is she even caught up in this? Why does Michael know who she is? Okay. So she'll her first. Um, yeah, no, sh- there's no answer. Okay. Well. <laughs> and when that happens, Oscar's like, what? she's not answering? Oh, shit. She does that sometimes. Call her again. Okay, she'll try to call her again. There's no answer. And Oscar's like, do, do it again. Do, do, do it again. Keep, okay, keep okay, calling her. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to try something else first. And she will try to call Torn. Uh, no answer. <laughs> okay. Well, she knows Raz is... Well, she doesn't fucking know what time it is. She'll try to call Raz. There's no answer. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. She... She can try to call like the comms on the ship. Yep. All right. Roll a. Com- no, I won't make you roll a contact. No, thank you. The the holographic. Yeah. So when she contacts the ship, the holographic face of a stressed out Ibiab appears in front of um, Karina's face, shouting, Pr- "Princess K- K- Karina, can you hear me?" Behind Ibiab are three people that Karina doesn't recognize, and Grizz. Oh my God, Ibiab! Thank you for answering. And stepping up next to Karina, Oscar's like, "Is it? Is it Vi- Vi- Vivian?" And on the holographic image, the older woman, who looks a lot like Dash, steps up and says, Oscar, wh- what the, what are you doing with the princess? Veronica and Ada are missing. The military came to Far Shore and they took Ada. And like red just like fills Oscar's face as he shouts, they did. What? Where'd they take her? And Ibi, I was like, we are unsure. Our ship has been so far unable to track Medic Dash's signal. And Vivian's like, Oscar. I looked into Veronica's notes here in her lab. I looked at what she was studying, Verada. I s- 
some of the x-rays. Oscar, there's something in her body. Some kind of worm. Oscar's like, no. Viv, don't don't tell me that. What what are you saying? And Vivian's like, I think the Covidians put it in there. I think it's eating her. She's gonna say, I don't even know where to start. Um, there were two. I saw two facilities underneath the these rigs. That they were connected, I think, by a. Um, sorry, the dog. They were connected by a tunnel, and when I was down there, because I was, as I explained, dropped into the ocean to die. When I was down there, I, I had to kind of bust in through one of the hatches, and I found a four-level lab. At the top level, they were doing something with plants. One of the levels, they had a bunch of, I don't know, there, were the, there was this armadillo that these scientists, like, melted. And then these white, like, worm-looking things, which it sounds like maybe maybe Vivian, you know. Does she know Vivian's name? Did Vivian say her name? Did Oscar say her name? Oh, yeah. So like maybe maybe the worm is what sh what you're talking about. There were worms in this in this animal, and it like stitched it back together, and it died, and it came back to life. And then when I went to the bottom floor, uh, I I don't even know how to explain. I saw a bunch of videos of that cycle lady talking about experimenting on, on people of Dauphine and there were, and she'll kind of try to stop and think for a minute because she doesn't really, like the horrors of those Ambro sapiens, like she can still see them in her mind. And she'll say there were just, you know, a bunch of, old people that had just been taken over by by similar monsters that I saw on my home world. And the only, they had a man down there, a man that I've, I've met. And she said that, you know, he was the last He was the only link to be able to make these experiments work, and he was missing all of his limbs. He 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 begged me to kill him. So I and he told me to burn everything, and so I did. That's 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 all I could think to do. And then once the explosion happened, I tried to escape, but there were soldiers. And I and I came out through the big hole that I had created, and the the Covenants are doing bad bad things to your people. Seemingly speechless, Adam looks from the holographic projection of Karina over to his wife and son, and um, Grizz and Ibiov, and and he goes, "If this is true," and they're doing tests on people and tests on Ada and Dash found out about it. Oh no. We, we have to do something. And like Karina watches from through the holographic projection as Vivian turns away from the screen, walks past Ibiov, Adam, Cody, Grizz towards the still cracked open weapons locker that Ibiov forgot to close earlier and opens it. Stepping inside, or stepping closer, Ibiev says, Uh, you don't have clearance to... But Vivian cuts her off, yelling from within the trailer, I don't give a fuck about your clearance! And, like, in utter shock, Cody's like, Mom! Before looking over at Adam to say, Dad, she can't be serious! Like, shaking his head, Adam walks past Cody up to the trailer, like, Viv, we... Now let's talk about this. 
But Vivian steps out of the trailer and shoves a riot vest at Adam and says, I'm not talking about anything here. These people came to our world. They ruined our culture. They lied, manipulated, and stole from our people. They're not taking our daughter, Adam. Not Veronica. We just got her back. Like staring back into his wife's eyes, Adam doesn't even hesitate. He just nods and says, I'm with you. From behind Adam, Cody says, holy shit. You guys are the best parents ever! Before he rushes past him into the weapons locker. And like clearly growing more frazzled, Ibiaf's like, no, no, wait, stop! Wait, oh, no, no, princess, what do I do? Ibiaf, stand down. And, and like, it's okay. I'm... I'm certain that Vasily would approve of this. Oh, all, right, all right. And like turning to face Grizz, Vivian hands the mechanic a 44 Magnum. We all need the help, or we need all the help we can get. He just looks at the gun and he says, they can't take that. She's like, why? I just can't take it. I'm going to help you, but I'm probably not going to need it. And she's like, all right, and she kind of like puts like it on a table and then like holsters a belt around her waist and she goes, I understand, but tell me, what do your morals tell you about breaking and entering? <laughs> I'm pretty damn good at that. So it's 7 p.m. Behind the purple plush velvet curtain, rumpled to the side of the stage, Raz and Cadmus stand next to each other, watching the actress paying, playing Lady Macbeth give a monologue on the stage. Raz is dressed in medieval robes and wears an identical projection mask to Cadmus that warps his face to make it look older. Whispering to Raz, Cadmus says, No, more. I want it to be dripping. I want them to see it. On the stage, the 30-year-old actress, clearly not a local, stands at the edge of the stage, projecting her voice to the audience. Alack, I am afraid they have wakened, and tis to done. The attempt and not deeds confounds us. Hark! I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss them, had he not resembled my father as he slept. I had not. She pauses, as if waiting something before saying. My husband! And Cadmus is like, quick, I'm on! And like, how much fake blood does Raz spray all over Cadmus's hands? And like, what does he say to Cadmus? Um, Raz pours uh just um he like does like a nice amount of spattering and a large amount going up to like his forearm uh to to really emphasize the the drippiness but not like over the top it doesn't look like he just got done just killing a bunch of people immediately it has like kind of a dried effect happening okay so and <laughs> um and he 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 like Pats um, Cadmus on the shoulder. He's like, get him. And with a smile and a wink, Cadmus runs out on the stage, acting like he's staggering from grief. The actress shouts, my husband. And Cadmus, like lost in this haze, is like, I have done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? And Lady Macbeth is like, I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did you not speak? And Cadmus goes, When? And Lady Macbeth says, Now? And Cadmus says, As I descended? And Lady Macbeth says, Aye. And Cadmus slumps down hard onto a prop of a great wooden chair next to the Macbeth's personal desk. Leaning forward to put his elbows on his knees, he makes sure the audience sees the little bit of blood dripping, on from, dripping from his hands onto the stage floor before continuing on with his acting partner. How is Roz feeling in this moment? Does he only watch the performance or does he do anything else behind the curtains? Um, Raz still kind of has a, um, a feeling like he still needs to be helping the stage hands. So even though he's like dressed up, he's helping get the next set of, uh, the next, uh, the next, uh, set ready, uh, to go. Um, He's trying to just occupy his mind, not thinking about being in front of so many people performing uh, something that he isn't very well familiar with. Okay. And how is Torin handling his fancy night out? 
Is he enjoying the show? Had he ever seen a play before or read any Shakespeare? And what is his opinion of how well the performance is going so far? Um, Torn isn't even sure. Uh, like, they haven't announced any of the actors, right? And Roz is wearing something over his face, so we can't even tell that it's really him. Um, he, not yet, yeah. Yeah, um, so, yeah, like, Torn's just kind of, like, am- ambiently, like, waiting for the spectacle of what he's expecting um, would be Raz's art, and he's, like, looking around the box, and he just feels kind of stuffy and uncomfortable. Okay, and up in the up in the Royals' private box, Delco is on his fourth Bellini and clearly enjoying the performance. Throughout the play, Calypso's giggled at the jokes, along with the rest of the audience, and and gasped along with them during murder Cadmus's murderous performance while dispatching King Duncan. And how many drinks has Torn had? And is um is he drunk or is he you know where where's he at with that? Like if he's sort of not sure if he's enjoying the show too much. No, I mean he's he's done enough administrative things that he's not. You know, he never he's not getting blasted. He's just you know sipping the second drink that he had okay. uh, after slamming the ones at the bar earlier. Okay, that makes sense. So on the stage, Cadmus reels, pounding his fist on the desk and shouting, But wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I had the need of the blessing and amen stuck in my throat. Standing next to Cadmus, the actress says in a cold, sharp tone, These deeds must not be thought after in these ways. It will make us mad. As the two actors on stage embrace, one of Delco's security officers steps into the private bay with everyone. Walking up next to Delco, he leans down and whispers into the administrator's ear about something. As Torn watches, Delco doesn't immediately react. He takes a moment before standing up, looking to the socialite women in Calypso. I hope you'll excuse me, but something's come up. Please enjoy the remainder of the show. I'll return before it ends if I can. Like straightening his suit jacket, Delco looks down at Torn and nods, Commander, before leaving the room with his guards. Turning around in her seat, Calypso cups her hands over her mouth and says to Torn, What's that all about? Can I roll observation to see if any of the other security guards are in on what he just heard? Yeah. No, um, nobody seems to do anything. Um, And in fact, like as he's looking around, Calypso says, Oh, don't worry about it. All the adults in my family do that. (sighs) Could be anything. Now that he's gone, you should come sit up front. I think uh, there's a surprise in the next scene. Um, yeah, Torn, like, uncomfortably, like, kind of looks around. He feels okay. I mean, he doesn't really see anything out of place, so he joins her and sits and sits in the front. Okay. A loud knock wraps throughout the theater as someone behind the stage door pounds. Lady Macbeth throws her hands up to her face in terror. Hark, more knocking! Get on your nightgown, lest occasion call us and show us to be watchers. Be not lost so poorly in your thoughts. And Cadmus stands up from the table and he goes, To know my deed, t'were best not to know myself. Wake Duncan with thy knocking, I would thou couldst! And the lights on the stage fade to black and the knocking grows louder. 7.12 p.m. Uh, Dash is unsure of who she can really trust right now, especially after Freckle just kind of abandoned them. So she's going to try and stay in the shadows. So she has... No idea where she's going. Yeah. And the soldiers were pretty nice to her. Like, they didn't seem to screw her over. So she seemed, she she thinks that they're kind of like a neutral party. So I guess she's going to be on the lookout for those soldiers that she saw. Yeah, I mean, she's, it's like really dark. The storm, you know, it's cloudy. There's a lot of rain coming down, like sheets of rain. Uh, she doesn't really see anybody particularly right now, at least. Just like lots um, of you know shipping crates filled with salt that is just like wet and like mushy and like massive mounds of unrefined salt and vats of refineries and you know towers and pillars and like different machines and you know just a whole bunch of fucking metal chaos in the dark basically because the power's out. Ugh. Okay. Um. She's gonna keep. I guess bouncing from like cover to cover. What would she be looking for other than the soldiers? It just a way off the rig. So I guess wherever a boat landing might be. Okay. So as you guys kind of come around a corner, Das sees a 
one of the soldiers and he's just kind of like standing out in the open like looking around he's got like a little flashlight on his gun and he's flashing it around looking in crevices creeping around i mean she's kind of hopeful she sees somebody now so she goes to to call out to him hey and like shouts over to him and like waves her arm and he hears it and he whips his gun over in her direction to like shine the flashlight on her it kind of like blinds her a little bit and um he hears her shout there she is i've got her over here and like turning to look dash sees one purple and green armored soldier rushing towards the group through the rain he shouts again put your weapon down because you're holding that assault rifle he goes put your weapon down and get down on the ground uh, all of you uh, oh what kids uh, shit hey, hands behind your heads and like when and that's when like dash kind of freezes and when a second and third soldier come running up into view behind him around a fucking massive tub, Dish, Dash sees the third man raise up a gun and fire directly in the direction of her, Ada, and the children, which is when Dash starts screaming. The first soldier tries to shout, No, no, stop! But when the second soldier joins in with the third, the first simply shrugs and follows suit. Dash, roll initiative. Actually, no, since you're frozen... I'm going to have them roll initiative. So Ada goes first. So when Ada sees this, she just like turns around to the kids and she goes, all of you turn and run, go, go. And the kids are just like, just like high pierced screams. Like, ah! it's like all these kids turn and run and like dash to fucking like distract them. The soldiers, what does she then scream at these soldiers? Is they like to stop them firing in the general direction and like focus on her. Uh, uh, she just screams, we're friendlies, we're friendlies, don't fire, But or hold, hold your fire. They cannot hear her over the gunfire, and I'm going to roll for one of these guys. Did I, I can't remember if no, I lost yeah, my, my vest or not. Yeah, it's gone, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so then go ahead, and so you take two damage. And I'm going to now roll these these other guys as well. Okay. So Dash is completely just like lit up with bullets. Just like they fucking firing line her. She just like... Just like fucking head to toe. Like describe how um, Dash is killed by these soldiers. <laughs> To want to? Yeah, but <laughs> you have to. Uh, I mean, it's it's a moment of of panic, but also relief and 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 bliss. Like at least those are the emotions going through her. Um, cause she doesn't have to do it anymore. She, she, she did what she could. Um, yeah. And just as these bullets rip through her, her body just kind of ricochets back with each one. And she just ends up going down on her back, eyes staring up at the sky. And the soldiers, one of them, like, they, they just completely don't give a fuck. They just, like, watch her go down. And one of them goes, she said dead or alive. What? And, the, and he looks at the others and he goes, get the old woman, the children. And uh, they all kind of, like, rush off to, like, go after Ada. And, like, Ada, like, is now cornered in, in like, by these fucking three guards, like, sort of between this, like, tub and, like, a stack of fucking, like salt trailers and like she turns around and like she's kind of like ushering all of like the kids behind her and she just throws her fucking middle both her middle fingers up towards the shoulder the soldiers like and the rain's coming down and like lightnings and she goes those that wish us harm on Dauphine can go fuck themselves and like when the soldiers kind of like pause and look at her one of them goes they didn't say anything about an old woman and the other guy's like call it in and behind them all of the bullets in Dash's body start to push out and like tink, 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 tink onto the fucking metal grating. 
as her wounds aren't bloody, but white. And billions of tiny alien worms stitch the holes in her body back together and Dash opens her eyes again. And none of the soldiers know that she's awake. Well, she's kind of surprised that she's back because uh, she thought for sure this time it was it was going to happen. I mean, she doesn't have to be super quiet because it's storming, right? Yeah. So she's going to aim at the the idiot who started firing first. And uh, she's going to take a shot at him. Do it. Oh, <laughs> okay. So let me roll his armor here. Yeah, so you fucking killed this dude. Go ahead and describe what happens. She fires three bullets at him and puts them all clustered uh, straight into his back and his torso. Okay. Roll initiative. Oh, man. Okay. So one of the guys yells, shoot the old woman. And as he raises his gun to fire at Ada, Dash hears the blast of gunfire and watches the shoulder who just said that crumples to the ground at his ally's feet because standing 20 feet behind him in a black and red suit of armor is Princess Karina Vasilievich. Her right arm is raised up to chest level and the still spinning barrel of her suit battle rifle smokes. Her robotic ear is missing and that side of her face is charred. Both of the princess's eyes are blood red from exploded vessels and the look of her face is one of determination. Karina roll initiative. So Dash and Karina can fuck these motherfuckers up. Instead of firing on Ada, this last soldier turns and fires at fucking Karina. And fucking misses. So it is now Karina's turn. Just do your shit. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna shoot... Well... I guess this map isn't updated right now, but I will shoot at the one who just shot at me with my battle arm. Well, yeah. So describe how Karina kills this guy and the battle arm literally like stops functioning when she like runs out of bullets with that fucking thing. Blow his, blow his chest open. It doesn't just blow his chest open. It fucking blows this dude off the side of the rig. Oh, okay. Well. He's just like... <laughs> like, just off well, the edge. She's just, like, way under her breath. No one can hear her. She just says, bye. 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 <laughs> no, she's... she's <laughs> so now all three of these fucking dudes are dead. And Dash sees Karina because the helmet's off. Did she see her get lit up or no? Like she hadn't she hadn't gotten there yet when Dash got shot. But she can see her clothes have bullet holes in them. Probably. I mean it's your call. What's, what's left of her clothes? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah she's she's fucked up. Like her clothes are pretty shredded, honestly. Uh, yeah. It's, so it's, it's funny because like there's those cliches of like women in horror movies like losing their clothes, but like Dash got ragdolled so much. <laughs> Like so much that like yeah, I don't know if she's got anything. Left. She's she's like there's holes like all over her fucking clothes for sure. I mean, I guess Karina can look around to see if there's some kind of like some kind of like tarp or something mm-hmm. to try to like toss the dash because this is just insane. And she's whether or not Karina's. I mean, yeah, I don't think she had rolled up yet because I think she definitely would have intervened. So she must have gotten there right at the end after Dash was already back on her feet. But it's clear that Dash is having a rough time. So, yeah, Karina will try um, to at least. It's some, been very rough. Yeah. <laughs> some piece of comfort. Uh, roll, uh, no. ro- roll an observation. See if she can find something. Oh, let's <laughs> <laughs> trying to help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So after Karina kills that guy and he falls over the edge, 
Dash watches as the teenage girl just like lets out this fucking guttural, like primal, just scream. And it is a feeling that Dash herself is very familiar with. And she watches as like Karina picks up this fucking like like walks over kind of looking around for something she's not sure what and she picks up this like big plastic tarp but sees that it's just way too fucking big for whatever her plan was and she throws it down on the fucking ground dash is like super confused that karina is here because like how why because she doesn't even know where she is um so seeing a friendly face is 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 weird for her and but also kind of relieving especially because it's it's Karina and uncharacteristically she goes over and she hugs Karina and she says what the hell are you doing here and Karina will just like she's gonna have to steady herself on dash <laughs> with the hug because she's still like yes Oscar gave her the adrenaline but she's also not having a good time so she kind of just like falls into Dash's arms, um, and she'll say, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't know. What are you, what are you doing here? I got caught up in some things and ended up someplace I probably shouldn't have been, but I've got a whole gaggle of children now and I need help getting them out of here. And before Karina, yeah. before Karina can respond, Dash's jaw drops when Oscar steps out from behind a pillar. She kind of... Mm, she's as confused as she was before. Now she's even more confused. And she goes, Oscar? And he, of course, rushes forward and like hugs her. And he's like, oh my God, I'm all right. And then he sees that Ad is there and he goes, Nana! And he just, like, kind of lets go of Dash immediately and, like, runs over and, like, throws his arms around to Ada and, like, brings her up in this big, really, like, tight hug. And he's like, oh, my God, you're okay. And he, like, turns and he looks at Dash and he goes, did you keep her alive? Are you keeping her safe? We're still standing, aren't we? And he, like, kind of, like, hugs the old woman and she's like, I'm all right, Oscar. Like, let me go. And he, like, puts her down and he kind of looks over her. And he goes, he says to Dash, he goes, this is where I work, V. This is just, this is my salt place. I, I ran, I ran into Karina. She said there's some, she said there's some horrible shit down, down there. And, and then it has something to do with that. I, I was praying you didn't have anything to do with it, but that goddamn FICA woman over there, she was talking to, talking to someone on the phone about you. What? What is going on? What'd you get yourself wrapped up into here? Ad is Ad is okay now. She'll she'll be fine. You don't you don't need to worry about her. You don't need to worry about me. Um, surprisingly, did you know Ada can take care of herself? V, look around you. This is not a normal situation. I know she could take care of herself, but come on, what? there's there's fucking military soldiers shooting at y'all. I, I know I know you're coming out of the military and this might be normal to you, but she's an old woman. Thank you for getting her here, but <sighs> Well, Oscar, how do we get her how do we get her off? How do we get her home? This is your rig, you should know way off of here. He's like the every every night there there there's a there's a you know, we all all the workers when we're done with our shift we wait around, there's a water taxi that comes and picks us up. We I mean, should be here in the next 30 minutes or so. If we can get on there somehow, if we can sneak past these soldiers. Because they're going to be watching it. They're looking for the girl. They're looking for Karina. And they're looking for you. So, they don't know Karina's here. They're they they, they just they, they're looking for someone in a black suit. But they're looking for you. So, we got to sneak on there something. And I, I don't know. I think that's our best bet. She's She's been trying to get a hold of your people. And... and but no one's but 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 people aren't answering. She looks over at Karina. What? Why are they after you? Um. Uh, yeah, well, so if you've been here, you you know about the explosion underwater. 
the explosion, the one that 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 caused all of this chaos. I didn't feel like I had a choice at the moment. That was you. It was. The things that they had under under in the facility were just too dangerous to to let continue like to to let exist. I agree, but they had some pretty compelling reasons. But what's done is done. We need to focus on getting off this thing. Who had compelling reasons? The Covenant. To do what? It's a lot to get into right now, Karina. Can we talk I mean, about this I, later? I, I feel like defending them... Okay, you know what? <laughs> I guess we need to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to just like... <laughs> Stop it, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> She's gonna like very, very awkwardly like look at Oscar and then look back at Dash. Yeah, I guess it's time to go. And Oscar kind of like kneels down and reaches a hand out to shake one of the kids' hands, and he's like, "Hi, my name, my name's Oscar. What's yours?" And the little boy's like, "My Davis." And with a smile, Oscar's like, "Nice to meet you, Davis." You know, I think you're very brave for being out here. Thank you for protecting my old Nana here. And, like, he, Davis kind of, like, looks up to Ada, and Ada, like, nods and smiles back down at him. Like, shifting to his side, Oscar does the same with the little girl next to him. He's like, hi, have you ever played hide-and-seek? And the little girl nods along with some of her other other kids, and he goes, good, okay, that that's what we're going to do right now, all right? So just follow us, and we're going to find the best place to hide, Okay. And like Davis and Stresha like both nod. And like, okay. And when Oscar stands up, he reaches a hand down towards Davis. He's like, all right, everyone hold hands for. And a soul splitting roar sinks the hearts of both Dash and Karina as they recognize the pained, genetically modified roar of a smartable Frankenstein monstrosity. Unlike the tiger bear that attacked Dash. She sees now that a lion-bear combination has walked into the open view nearby, dragging the headless body of a Kavindian soldier with one paw, while apparently having just finished chewing his head with its right. Staring at the group, the horrific creature drops both, turns to face them, roars again, and charges. Roll initiative. <laughs> Just want to go home. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Okay, well, I see that the fucking monster rolled a two, so that's cool. Good job, monster. Yeah. I mean, you just do what you have to do. You know, he's he's a he's a fucking pissed off Frankenstein smartable lion bear who's been. <clears throat> Tortured his whole fucking life. She's trying to figure out his purpose in this world. Animal handling. Just <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, that's not this game. <laughs> yeah, this thing becomes like somebody's pet. <laughs> All right, so we've got uh, both of you roll a d6. I'm going to say that because this thing has seen Karina already, it comes straight for her ass. Great. Perfect. Love that. So happy. Hey, roll that armor. That's not bad. <laughs> well, <laughs> Karina takes three damage. Three? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Karina wa or Dash watches as this thing just fucking like, like runs in, 
roaring side swipes Karina, just hits her in the chest, lifts her up off the air, and throws her like three feet, like tumbling backwards. Just like knocking the wind out of her. But it is Karina's turn. Okay. Does she have to get up? And she's probably gonna get up. Um you you would use your fast action to definitely get up. Okay. And then her slow action, she'll shoot at it with her well, she's I mean, isn't, isn't the armor bottom weighted? Didn't she just land on her feet? <laughs> yeah, she's standing. I mean, she's standing. Oh, okay. Well, I don't have any bullets left in my bogatier armor battle arm. But I did have an assault rifle. There's also You do have that assault rifle. And remember, that suit has other things as well. Like, you did run out of the sleep darts because you used those on those scientists, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. But it has other stuff, too. Okay, can I use a smoke bomb? Of course, yeah. So I would like to try to, like, punt it with this, right in the face with a smoke bomb. Okay. So that would just be a ranged combat? Do it up. One, one, one! No, 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 no! no. no. <laughs> oh no! It finally happened. I have so, been talking about this for weeks. Yeah, and it happened to me. So Dash watches as um. Wait, why does it... uh, Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, Dash watches as this thing roars, charges, like, drops the body in the head, throws him to the side, roars, charges forward, sideswipes Karina, knocks her into the air, lifts her to, like, the side, and she's, like, gasping for breath, and she just, like, aims her arm and shoots these, like, smoke pellets, like, into the gap between Dash and Oscar and Ada and the kids in, in fucking Project Union, and a bunch of just black smoke is, like... But, like, as it's filling the air around everything, she sees that, like, Karina just, like, falls face first, like, to the ground, like, unconscious. Well, she's going to try and uh, draw the creature's attention away from Karina. I'll say that it cannot see any of you right now. And Dash can just hear this thing fucking, like, roaring. Okay. Well, then, if it can't really see us right now and I can't get good visibility... I'm going to try to pull Karina away from it. She immediately uh, sprints over, grabs her by the neck of the suit, and starts pulling her away, taking advantage of the of the um, smoke cover. Okay. So, yeah, she fully successfully gets Karina to cover. Oh, this is hard. Because, like, I don't want to take too much attention away from them because if the smoke clears up and this thing can see uh oscar and the children um then you know don't definitely don't want don't want that um and she's having flashbacks to when she tried to do something similar and it it backfired um how far away are oscar and the kids able to get I'd say that they're a good, like, 100 yards. Like, they've made, like, a pretty good distance. Okay. So I feel like they're a good enough distance away. So we're going to find full cover until Karina comes out of her catatonic state. Is that something that she comes out of naturally? Well, you can command her to come out of it. Oh. You can roll a command. Okay, can I do that? Yeah. With this one? Okay. All right, you succeed, roll your panics, and then we'll figure out what she says and does. Okay, so um, what would she have to drop? I guess the assault rifle. So (laughs) when she went to go grab Karina to, like, pull her out of the smoke, Dash did not realize that the assault rifle slid off of her shoulder when she, like, went down to grab Karina to pull her backwards out of the smoke. And... As she's like sort of crouched in this like where where would they be like um like they're, they're they're like between like they're this in this like alley between like these two shipping containers and she's got Karina alone and, and Dash is kind of like hanging over and shirt hanging over and she's just staring up at the sky like past Dash's face 
and the thing is just like smashing like pounding on the on the uh shipping containers roaring and she sees that it like walks directly past the little alley that they're in and dash like freezes and she's just like there for a couple of minutes and she hears that like it's still around like huffing and puffing like rolling like smashing shit like looking for him but it didn't see him she gives her a, a vigorous shake and come on karina come back to me she is kind of hallucinating that she's on that ship where the mist was when they were playing tag and just kind of like stuck in the mist. She can't see anything. Like she knows that she's there, but she's, she's, it's just like a waking nightmare basically. Okay. And there's just like nothing. Nobody's on it with her, but she just can't wake up. And then once Dash kind of shakes her out of it, she kind of like blinks a lot and tries to shake her head like you know when you have a song stuck in your head and you try to like shake it to get it out she's just like shaking her head trying to but then that hurts her head because her ear is gone and she's in a lot of pain like when she comes back she's just pain that's just like what it is and everything she's experiencing is pain are you here are you back with me i need you here i'm here i'm here all right that's a good diversion i think they were able to run but we need to figure out what we got to do. Do you think we can sneak past it? Maybe if the smoke holds up. And the both of you hear from within the smoke, this like, V! Karina! V! God damn it. Who stayed behind? Can Dash tell who it is? Is it Ada? It's Oscar. Like Oscar. It's Oscar? Yeah, it's Oscar. God damn it. And Karina even. Karina, Karina will probably, not realizing that they're still like actively in danger, she'll say, she'll whisper, like, over here. And and he, you see through the smoke, like, he kind of, like, trots over and, like, sees you. And he's like, we got, oh, oh thank God, all right. That thing's still out there. The guys, they, they got had and the children over to a safe place. Oscar, what are you still doing here? You were supposed to leave with them. But I had to come back for y'all. I wasn't going to leave y'all. I, I know where they are. I, I had to come back to, to bring you to them. Look, v, v, everyone's walking out of here, okay? We, we haven't even gotten a chance to hang out yet. Just stay out of the way, Oscar. All right, well, y'all, y'all follow me. And what Green is ready to follow him. She's yeah. like, Smash Ball player, he's got a Smash Ball. We got this. He knows the ship or the rig. Yeah. So and she's and ready. Dash can't get to her gun to recover it, can she? She can pick it up. I mean, if you roll an observation, like to see if like she realizes that she's she's dropped it. Okay. Uh Yep. So she does realize that she's dropped it and she is able to find the gun to roll those panics. The reason why she goes berserk is because it was making absolutely no noise as it stalked Oscar through the fucking smoke. But Project Union 2 just like fucking like rears up like a fucking 12 foot tall bear like out of the fucking mist right behind Oscar with its fucking massive paws raised and its huge ass lion head just like coming in to bite the back of his head. And like fucking Dash sees it and she goes fucking berserk. And that means that she will not stop attacking this thing until it's down. So go ahead and roll your fucking attack on this thing. Like she picks up the gun and stands up and sees it coming for Oscar. Uh, would you say I would be able to aim? A hundred percent just because you're like fully a hundred percent focused on just saving Oscar's life right now. And like a, more than saving Oscar's life, but obliterating this thing. Okay. Okay. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, oh. Amazing. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Uh, describe how Dash kills this thing. Uh, yeah, just harnessing that fucking energy. She, she, um, it's it's very much like when she put the first Project Union down. Um, she does not stop until it stops moving. Okay, and where does she put its? Where does she put the like majority of her bullets? Oh, in its face. Okay, 
So Karina just watches as like Oscar is almost about to get taken by this thing. And like Dash just pushes him to the side and obliterates its entire face. Like the bones of its fucking skull and cheeks and eyes, just everything blast off. And its body that had been raised up to come into a fucking attack pose just like hits the ground hard right behind Oscar. And he like leaps out of the way like, oh, God, holy shit, me. (sighs) We need to get out of here. We need to like, it's not going to stay down. Okay. Yeah. And Oscar right. goes, the fuck do you mean it's not going to stay down? You blew its goddamn head off. Just go, Oscar. And like, as he turns to like, this massive fucking white tentacle just like just smashes across the fucking rig. And you hear this just like metal, like, like as the whole fucking thing just like starts to shake and shudder and all of these just like fucking waves of like white worms like start to like appear on the ground like moving near you guys as this like like living wave and oscar like backing up behind karina and fucking dash like what the hell is that oh my god what the hell is that whoa what the holy crap no yeah, she's Karina's running. Yeah, I vote. I vote. Get off the rig. Is is the boat here? Has it been thirty minutes yet? Well, it's like it's been like ten seconds. You are now blocked from the direction that Ada and the kids and the other guys went off to. So, Oscar's just like o- Oscar's just just yelling. He's like, "What the fuck is that? Oh my god!" And as he does so, you guys watch as this just, like, sort of humanoid, like, there's just, like, this melted head with, like, a torso and, like, six arms on, like, one side that just, like, drifts out of the side of this, like, massive tentacle. It's got no eyes, and it's just, like, six arms, like, forged together into a scythe, and it just, like, whips it directly at Karina. Dodge? Can she dodge? It is a. It is technically a close combat. So, but, 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 we got to roll initiative. Okay. What'd you get? Twelve. Wow. Oh my god. So, roll your armor. Oh my oh. god. So. Dash and Oscar watch as Karina, like, like, okay. So the scythe, like, just comes in and, like, hits her in the fucking chest, digs into the armor, and, like, you watch as it completely, like, takes her fucking breath away and sweeps her off of the edge of the rig, and she's off into the water. <laughs> um, how, how much, so is that broken? That's dangerous. Um, broken? Because I have second wind. Roll your second wind. Yeah, you'd be broken. Because that's, so can, that's, 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 that's two, four, six, eight damage. Yeah, so you're broken. Yes, broken. So I want to roll. Wow. It says, when you're broken, you can get back on your feet immediately without anyone giving you first aid. Which I guess she wouldn't be getting on her feet, but she wouldn't be dead. Roll for stamina for every plus one, you get a health point back. Okay, please, 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 please. <gasps> Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so like I guess the scythe wasn't as sharp as it might have looked like. It was more of like a blunt. Like she just got so it didn't like cut through her. Oh yeah, she's dangling. She's her feet are like going back and forth and back and forth and she's like trying as hard as she can to hold on and she kind of she ignites her little boots. And it pushes her up. Yeah, it pushes her up onto the edge of the rig where she's got her elbows up and she kind of rolls on onto her back. And then she'll just, like, because she, I mean, it was more for flavor earlier, but I think, yeah, this is definitely like, if he handed it to her, she can can use it now. 
And so, so like, just, like, injects her. <clears throat> she stabs it and, like, just, like, all of this, like, her heart, like, and, like, oh, oh, and she's, like, up on her feet. Karina watches after she stabs the fucking adrenaline into her chest as, like, Dash is firing at this thing because it comes to, like, grab at Oscar's uh, leg with a tentacle and pull at him. And she like, fires at it to get it off. And they're trying to hide behind this big fucking... Um, metal crate container and it whips and just throws the metal crate container like soaring off like into the sky and, and dash or and, and oscar's just like yelling and he's like we're, we're running out of places to hide we we need some kind of distraction this thing's too goddamn big we we need something huge this, uh, something too big for it to ignore like and dash is, is screaming or dash is standing there next to him and like, karina like kind of runs up all fucking yoked up on adrenaline she's gonna run up on them and if he's yelling for a distraction, she has a distraction idea. Oh, shit. Uh, okay, well, what does she say to him? She says, oh, hold on, I got this. And then she jumps off the side of the rig. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so, if, okay, so text me what you, th- okay, text me what you're thinking. Um, so what does Dash do? Oscar just looks, Oscar looks at, watches Karina fucking dive off the rig and he looks over at Dash and he goes, what the fuck? What the fuck did she just do? We got to get out of here. Uh, and Karina, we trust. Um, uh, Dash is going to put her faith in Karina. Um, cause she knows like, <laughs> She's not going to do damage to this thing, so it's kind of futile to sit there and try and attack it, um, other than keeping it off of them. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just keep looking for for a way out. Just keep inching closer to where they can get off the rig. All right, roll an observation for me. Okay. So, tremble, tremble, tremble. So, the reason why Dash starts trembling is because she sees Dr. Feichel running from the swarm up a staircase towards an office building at the top of the tallest tower. Uh, she's trembling with fury. I mean, like, she kind of wants to take a shot at Feichel just because. Uh, but she knows it's not going to do anything to her. Yeah. So does she, like, chase after her? Uh... I don't know that she's going to chase after her. I don't think, um, I don't think it'd be worth it for her to abandon Oscar to try and run after her right now. Okay. So what does she then do now that they're kind of out in the open and everything's going crazy and Karina has abandoned them? Um, Well, she's still just focused on moving towards uh, where that taxi is hopefully going to pick everybody up. It is, and just kind of... They're completely blocked by this, like, mass of, of stuff. Yeah. Uh, is there any place for them to hide? Um, yeah, I mean, where, where does she look to hide? <coughs> uh... I don't know. There's no, like, shipping containers that are open that they can get into, is there? Um, yeah, I mean, did she, she got the, she got the observation. So, yeah, they could def- they hide in a, in a salt container for sure. Okay. Um. Actually, she is going to go after Feichel. She's going to stash Oscar. And mm, yeah, she's going to stash Oscar in the in the shipping container. And she's going to tell him, don't fucking move until Karina gets back. And he's like, V, what are you doing? What's going on? Going after that bitch Feichel. Alone? No, absolutely not. I'm coming with you. 
I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not some baby. Okay, I can, I can, I can help you. And what happens if you get hurt, Oscar? Well, that's why you're here, right? You're the doctor. Uh, I can only fix so much. I can't fix death. Well, listen, I'm not hiding. I'm not hiding, V. Like, I know you want me to stay here, but if you're going after her, I'm coming with you. And that's just what it is. So, if she, listen, she put that shit in my grandma. If you're going to bring her to justice, if you're bringing her down, she sounds like a dangerous as hell woman, and I'm not, I'm not letting her get away. So I'm coming with you. Oh, stick close. You show me. Go ahead. I'll follow you. All right, and she's going to go towards uh, where she saw Fico going into the building. Okay. 7.15 p.m. Torn is beginning to fidget as the play begins to reach its halfway point, and he becomes acutely aware that Delco never returned from his, never returned to his seat. Behind the stage, Roz prepares for his big moment with Cadmus. Cadmus's voice comes across the theater. Scene four, outside Macbeth's castle. Three score and ten, I can remember well. Within the volume of which time I have seen hours dreadful and things strange. But this sore night hath trifled former knowings. Wow. Um, ah, good father, thou seest the heavens as troubled with man's act. Threaten his bloody stage. By the clock tis day, and yet dark night strangles the traveling lamp. Is the night's predominance or the day's shame? That darkness does the face of the earth in tomb when living light should kiss it. Tis unnatural, even like the deed that's done. On Tuesday last, a falcon, tiring in her pride of place, was by a mousing owl hawked at and killed. And Duncan's horses, a thing most strange and certain, beauteous and swift the minions of their race, Turned wild in nature, broke their stalls flung out, contending gainst obedience as they would make war with mankind. Tis said they eat each other. They did so. To the amazement of mine eyes, that looketh the pawn, here comes the good Macduff. How goes the world, sir, now? Why? See you not. <laughs> It's, uh, it's known who did this more than bloody deed. Those that Macbeth has slain. <laughs> <laughs> Lightning and thunder crackles across the stage. As I'm Mac laughing too hard. Alas, the day. What good could they pretend? They were sunburned. Malcolm and Don Laban. The king's two sons are stolen away and fled, which put upon them suspicion of the deed. Against nature still, thriftless ambition that wilt raven up thine own life's means, then tis most like their sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. He is already named and gone to scone to be infested. And where is Duncan's body? Carried to Combkill and sac the sacred storehouse of his predecessors and guardian of their bones. Will you to scone? No, cousin. I'll to fife. Well, I will thither. Well, may you see things well done there. Adieu! Lest our old robes sit easier than our new. Farewell, Father. God's benison go with you, and with those that make good of bad, and friends of foes. And all three of the actors walk off the stage to the left, right, and rear. After the curtains close, the lights dimly come up, and a voice over the loudspeaker announces a brief intermission that will end in ten minutes. Calypso stands up and stretches her arms up tall before saying, uh, Well... 
That is actually better than I expected. Ross is a pretty good actor. <laughs> I hope the second half is as good. What do you think? Um, Torn kind of like hears Calypso, but is kind of like in platitudes mode. Uh, yeah, that that was really quite good. Uh, who who's that uh, fetching person playing uh, Macduff? That's Roz. That's Roz. That's what <laughs> I'm saying. Roz is a pretty good actor, right? And then Torn is like, did he did he lie to me? I he said he was going to work the background. Well, I mean, when I was coming in here, I saw my brother, and he said Roz was taking over for one of the the uh, the actors who had stage fright. That was him. And then, like, Torn's like, I hope this boy will be able to remember anything that happens today. What happened to Delco? She's like, oh, I don't know. He's probably doing business somewhere. He never lets me in on any of that. Yeah, and with that, Torn kind of, like, looks um, to the head of security and kind of, like, asks. He's like, he said he'd be back, right? Uh, I think he said he'd be back if he could. If he could. Does this he do this kind of thing often? He made a point to point out to me that he would be back. Uh, he was kind of saying it to the three women that he was with, I think. Um, but I mean, yeah, he's a busy man. Uh, I've seen him do it plenty of times. The, the, I mean, this is just one of like, um, well, I guess there would be no security. There, there, there wouldn't be any security left. Yeah, the, the only security would be like probably external grounds. It, it would. So yeah, this would be this. I guess this would be Damascus. So this would be Cali one of Calypso's security. So it's a woman. So she's like. Oh, okay. So it's just it's just what the it's the are. one. It's the one that Torn asked to put lotion on his back, and oh, she, okay. she's like, um, so yeah, they're chatty. They're friendly. Yeah, and she's um, like, well, I've. I mean, he does this all the time. He's a busy man. I've I've seen him come and go. The amount of times that the children have been in the middle of movies and he. He's been watching the like the beginning with them, and then he gets a call and gets up and leaves. It's it's, it's constant. Yeah, and then Torn's like, ah, oh, sounds about right. Probably nothing to worry about. I'm gonna hit the head. All right, I'll see you when he gets back. It was a ten minute intermission, right? Yes, sir. So perfect. What does Torn do in his ten minute intermission? And, at, oh. and as he goes to leave, Calypso's like, uh, "Will you bring me back some water from concessions and something chocolate, please?" And thank you, Torn. <laughs> Torn just like chuckles. He's like, "I'm a servant now." And he and he steps out. I mean, to Calypso, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> all right. So, where does he? Does he? What, what's he doing? Is he? Torner who wants to check his comms device, see what's going on. Um, <laughs> he he wants to. He's happy to exit the. I'm sure they have like an intermission area where they can like check on their comms, and he would like to do that. All right. Well, it doesn't take the big man long to make his way down to the third floor's private balcony suite to the grand foyer. And there's people everywhere milling about, talking to, or taking the chance to go into the theater's bathrooms, concession, purchase concessions, discuss the show amongst each other. Uh, Delco and his cadre of security officer, officers are nowhere to be seen. Uh, bypassing the crowd, Torn arrives to the security entrance and after a brief back and forth over his provided ticketing number, is provided with the communication device. Before he's able to do anything with the device, however, the friendly voice of Governor Reaching Eye speaks up behind him. Uh, Commander, uh, what, what a great showing, or what a great showing, wouldn't you say? I had no idea the young prince would be partaking in the performances. For someone in so, court. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. For someone so young, he understands the uh, painful nuance of Macduff better than I'd have expected. <laughs> <laughs> and Torn turns around. And he's like, I can't pretend to understand the painful nuances, but I will say that I am very surprised by his performance. I, I don't see the Princess Karina anywhere. Did she decide to forgo the evening's event? I thought for sure I'd see her here. And Torn's like, I'm seeking the very answer to that question now. Oh, God, is that language seeping into me? And then he like turns away. And he's like, oh, good luck. And he just kind of like turns off like you know, to go focus on one of the he many he people. totters on. He yeah. totters on. Yeah. Many, many people interested in his attention. Okay, great. So um how does Torn find privacy? I guess the bathroom. Uh yeah, I think uh maybe maybe he, he uh after requesting the uh his comms device from security he asks, is there is there a safe place to take a call? And uh one of the sort of venue people is like, uh yeah, there's a there's a hallway in the south bathrooms that is cordoned off um but yeah, don't don't go into the other rooms about that back, back there uh and he goes thanks so much um can you roll observation to see if this guy is like manipulating him into a place it's really loud <laughs> he, he, i will say that uh he's like a 17 year old kid oh he's a kid so he's in a shit okay um so torn makes his way into the back and then immediately tries one of the doors 
Okay. Uh, the one of the doors, it seems like it will be, you know, safe to enter. When he opens, it's like a little conference room. There's like uh, scribblings writ- written all over a whiteboard for plans that like Cadmus has in regards to uh, staging the actors around oh, the okay. stage. So it's, it's a planning room. Okay. Yeah, it's there's nothing creepy about this place. Yeah. So Torn, upon entering the door, um, he immediately like pushes back against it and then slides uh, to the floor so that his back is firmly against it with his feet planted square. And then he tries to see uh, what he may have received while he was in, in the play. Okay. And when he does that, I'm going to cut over to Roz behind the curtain of the stage. The chaos continues to reign as stage hands run around, setting up the stage for the next act of the play. Knowing that his performance is more prominent in the story during the story's second half than it is in the first, Roz sits alone in a corner on top of a wooden crate painted to look like a boulder. Quietly, he speaks his own lines back to himself as they're projected by the hollow mask. His attention is cut when he sees Cadmus, still dressed as Macbeth, victoriously popping and locking his arms as he approaches Roz. We're crushing this! You're doing great out there, man! Corge Glooney can suck it! You're my Macduff until you guys leave! Um, Raz is sitting there and he's like patting his chest, trying to calm down. And he looks up at him. He's like, oh man, that was much scarier than I thought it was going to be. I, I don't think anyone's having a more stressful night than me tonight. (laughs) (sighs) And, uh, Camus chuckles and he goes, oh buddy, you've got no idea. Making sure that this goes perfectly. I mean, it's, it's my first night on Dauphine, you know, like I, 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 I oversaw the building of this place. Everything has to go perfectly. Thank you so much for taking part in it. This means the world to me. No problem. Raz chuckles lightly as he's he looks up at um at Cadmus. He's like, "Well, we're gonna kill it in the second half, right?" Oh man, we're gonna kill it. And one of Cadmus's security guards walks by dressed as like just a random royal Scottish thane. And when he sees Cadmus, he does finger guns. Uh, he does finger guns at the prince and shouts at Roz. Or he does finger guns at, at Cadmus and shouts, "That's our Macbeth!" And then like high fives Roz before continuing on his path down towards the dressing rooms. And Cadmus is like, "How fun is this? You should, uh, you should talk to your dad when when you return to Odessa and convince him to let you move to Govinda like Bobby. The three of us could do stuff like this all the time. <laughs> That'd be really fun." Uh you're going to really like Bobby. Uh, he's he's like me, but way funnier. Well, do you think he'd be a good actor? I think he'd be really good at the action bits. Okay, okay. All right. Like you said, we're going to kill it. And he puts his hand up to like high-five Raz before he heads off. Raz high-fives him. And as he's alone again, what does he do? Raz uh, sits there and just sort of like tries to focus on his breathing to calm down. He's like, Whew. all right, we can do this. And looks, looks up at the, um, at the sets being moved and just sort of focuses on the art. High fives are Raz's love language. Um, and yes, I did say Corge Glooney. Um, I did, yes. <laughs> it's so good. Same um, It likes too fast almost, but... <laughs> I tried to do it quick. <laughs> um, so within the private safety of the um, planning room, Commander turns on the sliver, cycles through the opening prompts, and sees that his short-range communications list is filled with messages and missed calls. 30 from Ibiov and two from Karina. Torn upon seeing the, uh, um, the messages, uh, jumps to his feet. Um, that's deeply unusual, and he's feeling a, a sense of growing anxiety. Um, just Ibiov and Karina, you said? Yes. Okay, uh, he, he tries to see whatever, Karina, whatever message Karina might have left him, um, but also checks the timestamp against them. Okay, he's the messages though, right? It's just like 
they're Miss just call. calling, 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 calling. Yeah, yeah. There's one. Question. There's one from Would Maybe of that's like commander, commander, call me back immediately. Something is something is terribly wrong, and okay, then, okay. like it's just a bunch of calls, 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 and he sees that like it's over the span of basically the last hour. Uh, yeah. All right. And, torn. And what were you gonna say, real quick, Haley? Um, would it? Sh- because she was calling from Oscar's comm, so would it have shown up as her? It wouldn't have shown up as her. That's right. That's a good call. So it's thirty. It's thirty calls from Ibiyov, and then two calls from a, a number that Oscar's never seen before. Uh, and that Torn has never seen before. Okay. Um, the Ibiyov calls are enough. Uh, he would be triggered by that. So um, Torn moves to leave the the safety of the of the, uh, the the safe room, and uh, he wants to make a beeline for the ship. On the way, he's going to grab a. What's that? You wouldn't call. Oh, you him? think? I uh, yeah, like I guess. It, yeah. All right. Um, you said Torn. call me back. Call me back. So. All right. Torn. Torn opens comms to Ibiyov. And immediately, like a holographic picture of Ibiyov's face appears, and she's clearly stressed out. And she's like, "Commander, do you have location come from for Prince Raz?" Ibiyov. Uh, yeah, I have. I have eyes on Raz. What's going on? <sighs> Good. Okay. I've been trying to reach you for the last hour. There are. Uh, things you must know. Medic Deshi's family showed up here to the ship concerned for her safety. They, I'm not sure what to say here, but it, it seems as though Dash was looking into some kind of uh, freak anomaly and uh, medical, I don't know, elderly family member, something to do with parasitic worms and uh, uh, Dr. Feichel. It was a lot, hard to parse through. Commander, I think our mission is in dire danger. Her family took weapons from our hold. I, I, I tried to stop them, but I am not the soldier. Grizz, he, he left. He went with them. They said they needed a thief, and he offered his skills. I, I don't... You need to contact Karina immediately. Commander, something is not right on Dauphine. The Kavindians, I, I think Medic Dash found something she wasn't supposed to see. And, like, uh, and then he, he like, looks direly down at Ibiyav's, uh hologram, and he's like, Are you still with the ship? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I can get it ready for you if you need me to. Um, and then he, uh, and, and she goes, do you, uh, he goes, do you have, do you have comms on Grizz? I do. Yes. And he's with Torn Dash. Torn with, with, yeah. Yeah. He's with Dash's family. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, all right. So upon that, uh, he'll ask, do you have location information on Dash? Uh, there's no information on Dash. We have been unable to find her. Uh, and then he, Karina like, yeah. is six miles out in the ocean. <laughs> And Torn's like, uh, com- repeat, Ibiya, Karina is not in her room. She is on an oil rig. She contacted me. She told me that she found a secret underwater lab with genetic monstrosities and torturous scientific experiments being done on the people of Kvinda. She's there. Ibiya, I'll be there shortly. And then he, he closes comms. Um, and he, he's basically, he's basically going into full fucking military lockdown on himself right now. Yeah. So, uh, Torn is going to, uh, beast through, uh, he wants to get back to the security, the security depot, uh, the, where, where he got the sliver. Okay. He's going to tell the kid, he's like, listen, you have to get the princess or the under princess, a, a glass of water. And it what was a chocolate cookie. Yeah. And, uh, you have to get her a glass of water and a chocolate cookie or it's your ass. And he's like, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He remembers that. Yes, sir. And then, and the, yeah, and then Torn goes, listen, kid, what's your name? Uh, uh Charlie. You're not going to make any mistakes with this, right, Charlie? No. And then he looks at the other security guard in the area, he's like, just make sure you get that fucking shit up there. And then, uh, Torn, Torn just, like, with, like, blistering speed sprints out. Okay, sweet. So, describe what dash does upon reaching the stop the top of the stairs of this fucking tower where there's the door to this office where she saw dr feichel going to and like karina's behind her or um oscar's behind her he's got his little fucking green smash ball sort of at the ready and uh like what what is what's going on here so are there any like windows on this door uh, the door itself, no, but the there are windows sort of like to the side that, uh, of the building that she could sort of like peek her head around in and, and like see if she can see what's inside. Yeah, she wants to see if she can see if Cycle's in there before she just goes like busting into this room. Sure. Go ahead and roll an observation for me. Oh, 
<laughs> These panics are disgusting. All right. As she like peeks around, she sees that there Feichel is in there, but she has two security guards with her. And she starts to tremble when she sees this because it's it's a hundred percent her. Like she saw at her distance and she saw the shock of black and white hair and the lab coat and she was like, That's obviously that bitch. But like getting up here and like actually seeing her up close and she hears fucking Feichel in there just like yelling at the top of her lungs like those children the old woman the property of the Covenden Super Science Oversight Bureau uh, hey, we need to get out there we need to find them they're not going anywhere today but back with me back to Covenda and like um, the soldiers are like we're gonna we're gonna get him man we're gonna get him and Dash freezes when she sees this and realizes that like they're fucking hunting Ada, not just Dash, but Ada and the children that she thought she had successfully saved. And then I guess we'll say she seeks cover by like fucking crouching down, sort of like in the door, like a way to get away from the window when like Dr. Feichel sort of turns to look in that direction and she's like cowering. Like Oscar kneels down next to her and he's like, Is she in there? As she's sitting there trembling, she nods her head, yes. He's like, all right. Is she alone? No. How many guards? How many were there? Two? Yeah. There were two, and then her. Okay. So, I'm going to look. I'll see if I can see what I can see. Stay here. Just keep the gun ready, all right, in case the door opens. She readies the gun. He like kind of peeks his head out and looks. He goes, "All right, I, I think I, can, I think I could get him. I think with with the smash ball, I could I could whip it. If I can arc it, whip it, come through the window, maybe get one of the guards. If you kick the door and take the other one out, just be careful, Oscar." He's like, "Look, the last thing I want." For today, or the last thing I want for to happen today is for anybody to die. Just tell me when. And he like steadies himself and like gets gets into like a, a smash ball stance that like she has not seen in a very long time. But she knows that it when he gets into that stance, Oscar means business. All right. So she takes a, another steadying deep breath, and then she nods at him to go as she goes to kick in the door all right roll a i guess it would be a close combat only one panic that time that's cool yeah no, that's good all right so dash immediately upon kicking the door in which is pretty fucking tight i'm just gonna be real with you um like she kicks the door in and both of the fucking guards like kind of turn to look and like as that happened oscar whips the fucking smash ball around the side of the building and the like the spikes come off of the ball and it shatters through the glass into the room wait what is that is not right oh it's because it's on ranged combat that's why Okay, so yeah, he hits one of the guys, and it like sticks into the back of his armor, and when he pulls, he fucking yanks the guy up into the window, and like the guy's literally getting fucking like yanked out of the window, and like his arms are to the side, and, and he's unable to fire, and he pulls the trigger, and it just like fires randomly, and like blows out a bunch of windows, and like scatters across the consoles, and Dr. Feichel like crouches down, and that's when it gives Dash time to sort of get up to this little like console island in the middle of the room, which would give her cover. And it is now, um, I guess it would be initiative. Okay, so yeah, Oscar is gonna fucking try to fucking yank this motherfucker out the goddamn window. Yep. So Dash watches as, or she hears from through the doorway as Oscar is just like, Aah! and like she watches as the fucking security guard just takes goes out the window like disappears out the fucking window and like you hear the wilhelm scream like that famous movie scream where he's like ah like just out into the water no it's more like this yeah yeah like just just <laughs> gone like that guy's just gone and it is now 
the soldier's turn. He's going to use his uh, fast action to sort of like get into a position to where he can see dash, but that means he can't aim. So he's just going to fire on her. All right. Roll your armor. I don't have any. Oh, yeah. Okay. So she takes two damage. And it is now Dash's turn. Um, she is going to take aim and fire back at him. Do it. All right. So all of his armor like deflects it. And when that happens, it is Oscar's turn. And he steps into the fucking doorway and just whips the fucking smash ball right at the guy's head. Oh, man. Okay. So, like, he steps into the door. Like, Dash fires at this dude. And, like, a bunch of bullets go out the windows and, like, shatter the rest of the remaining windows and, like, deflect off of his armor and shit. And, da- and Oscar steps into the doorway, whips the smash ball. It, like, hooks into the dude's helmet. And he yanks his arm down. And the dude just, like, smashes into the fucking ground. He's, like, down on the fucking ground, like, trying to push himself up. And Dash gets a free attack. <laughs> All right, she is going to fire at him again. All right, the bullets do block it, but I'm going to say that this guy's been through enough that he is unconscious, laying on the ground, because Dash lit him up, and Oscar just, like, unconscious his ass. He only had two hit points anyways, so with the smash ball, he's, he's out. Um, and... Dash is screaming, so I guess what would she scream at Dr. Feichel upon entering this room? BRB. That's what she screams at her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and outside the window, like, it's raining still, and there's, like, white tendrils and shit going around everything, like, wrapping up. Like, it's it's getting crazy. Um, and she's just going to scream at Feichel, what the fuck did you unleash? And Georgina looks back at her, and she's like, what did I unleash? This is your fault. You're a spy. The destruction of the facility, all those investments and hours of research. I don't care what Delco says. He might have plans for you, but I could give a fuck. She screams right back at her. This wasn't me. I was with you the entire time. She's like, well, then who the fuck was it? It was the princess. And Oscar, and, and like, when Dash says that, um, fucking Feigl just kind of, like, freezes. She goes, princess? Which princess? O- the Odessan princess? Uh, Dash wants to backpedal. Nope. <laughs> and as that's happening, Oscar just, like, rushes past Dash, Dash and, like, grabs a hold of Dr. Feigl, like, by her lapels and, like, grabs her and, like, yanks her up by by, it. And he's, like, looking her in the face and he goes, what the hell did you put in my goddamn grandma? And she just ignores Oscar completely and she looks past him over to Dash and she goes, tell your brute to get rid of me or you know what I'll do to her. can't do anything right now, Feigl. You ain't near your fancy little computer. Because that's how she controls it, right? She's got a fucking like, little handheld thing. That's what she had in the office. Oh. Uh, Oscar put her down. And he's like, what? Why? We've got her. She'll kill Ada if you don't. He's like, if you kill my grandma... I will rip your head off. And Feigl is just like, if you did, it wouldn't matter. He just kind of like lets go of her. And she's standing there and she like walks past him and she looks at Dash and she goes, now tell me, what do you mean that it was the princess? I don't know the whole story. But I know that the princess was in the facility and she's the one that caused the explosion I see is she the one running around currently in the black and red armor I don't know where she is and Oscar goes why are you looking for the princess and and um, 
Feigl looks at him and she goes, well, if what your wife is saying is true, then she's a terrorist. We will find her and we will bring her to justice. And Oscar looks at her and he goes, no, she's just a little kid. She was help. She was helping me. She was helping Ada, and she was helping the kids. She's not a terrorist. V, tell her she's not a terrorist. Dash doesn't have any words. She just kind of looks away from him. And Feigl turns, and she's like, "All right." And she pulls up the comms, and she like taps into the phone, and she's like, "Do do do," and they're both just like standing there, and. Dash watches as this fucking like holographic image of of Delco appears, and he's riding in the back of a car. And she goes, "Are you?" Or she goes, "Are you alone?" And he goes, "One second. And he presses a button, and like you hear this like of the like the window like closing to like block him out from his driver. And he goes, "I am now. What's going on?" And Feigl's like, "The Odessans. It was them. It wasn't Dash. It was the princess." She blew the lab. She's here. Send everyone. Send what you have immediately. We don't know how deep this runs. And like, Dalko's like, what are you, what are you talking about? The, the girl? The little one? The blonde? The, the She blew the labs? And like... Feichel turns and like kind of shows the the image to Delco of Dash standing there, and Oscar's just kind of like flabbergasted, like unsure what's going on. And what does Dash say when like she kind of locks eyes with Delco? Do you trust me now? And she's like, and he's like, well, if you can bring me the princess, I assure you, that answer is yes. And then, that wasn't part of our deal. And he's like, the deal has changed. She blew the lab. We lost our investments. You're part of the team that brought them here. You know what? Instead of killing the king, kill the girl. And then the and then he goes, Georgina, I'll send a ship. And like he, she's like, uh, of course. And I'll see you soon. Make sure they pick me up. And um, the image closes, and Oscar is like looking at V, and he goes, "Kill the king, V! What? What the hell is going on? And, like, You're not gonna kill that girl!" And he looks at Fightle, and he goes, "We're not gonna kill that girl. It's not happening." Oh, they'll kill Ada. He's like, "I'm not. We can't trade, a Veronica. We can't trade." A a life for a life. I mean, she's just a kid. What are you talking about? You're a doctor. And um, as he's just kind of like losing his mind right now, Feichel's like, the Odessans can send everyone they need. They can send spies. They can send an army. It doesn't matter. With the power that we have, they will be destroyed. Your wife is simply being intelligent. She's on the right side of this. And and like Oscar is just kind of like defeated. And and he kind of looks over at V and he goes, Is this true? V, you're with them? Not with anyone. But they're keeping Ada alive right now. And he kind of just like walks away from her he turns his back on v and like he just kind of like walks over to the windows and he's just kind of like standing there looking out the windows and like it's raining and thundering and like everything's just fucking chaos and he just kind of like chuckles to himself it's like (laughs) (laughs) oh doc i don't think she needs an army or she, he goes, oh, Doc, I don't think that Odessa needs an army. And Feigl's, like, standing between Oscar and, like, Dash. And she goes, oh, really? And why exactly is that? And Oscar just, like, points out the window. And he goes, because you're on a planet of fucking savages. And as Feigl and Dash turn and, like, look through the tower's windows following where Oscar points... 
Dash and Doc, Dr. Feichel like squint like into the distance and Dr. Feichel is like, what is that? And like lightning cracks throughout the sky like a glowing spider web between cascading raindrops to illuminate the ocean beyond as a wave ripper driven by Vivian Artugia dashing site rockets across the water towards the rig dragging a huge wave behind her in the seat next to Vivian a weary panicked and terrified Grizz holds on to the boat for dear life obviously screaming and shifting his head back and forth from Vivian to the wave behind her at once, three more wave rippers explode over the top of Vivian's wave, all connected together via cables. Raising her eyes far above Vivian's wave, Dr. Feichel sees a second, far greater tsunami being dragged by Adam Prolizzi, Cody Dashing Lore, and Brody Dashing Grin. Her face grows paler than it already is, but Dr. Feichel laughs and says, What What can that do? Let them come, lambs to the slaughter. So. <laughs> Does Dash say anything? Does Dash no, wrong? she is like reeling in her shame right now. Okay. What were you going to say, Haley? I was just going to say, I think this might be a good point for Karina to make her re-entry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Do your thing. So, I guess the, when she had fallen into the water, she had ignited her little boots, which give off like light and she was swimming around specifically trying to attract attention, the attention of something that she had seen earlier that day that some people might remember that. Oh, fuck, what was that guy's name? Moby Dick? Doby Mick? Doby Mick? Yeah. <laughs> what do we call him? <laughs> Ooh, the old guy that told the story? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, yeah. Never gave, we never gave him a name, but it's Doby Mick now. <laughs> Agreed. We never gave that old man a name, but it's a hundred percent Doby. Well, because we were talking about Moby Dick. Yeah. Um. So she had seen the the monster of of legend that earlier. Um. And so she was swimming around. It's a big, big ocean, so it probably took her a while. But she was attempting to gain the attention of the Triton. So during Karina's um, solo, she ran into this thing. Oh, shit. <laughs> so this is a native creature to the planet of Dauphine called a Triton. It is like a hundred yard long fucking sea dragon that is just absolutely massive. That's just too damn long. <laughs> <laughs> so you're harassing Godzilla. It's yeah. Exactly. <laughs> By light, so it's attracted by light. She watched it just completely eat three mech harvesters under the water. Oh god! Um, and so she said her distraction was that she was going to go down there and light a pursuit to distract this thing. We rolled some secret rolls. So go ahead and describe what uh, everybody sees. I guess is this fucking tidal wave is like coming towards the rig. Yeah. So she was thinking that the only thing big enough to fight those worms tentacles was going to be this and i think it's going to be insane because she's she's not she's not thinking she's 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 just acting on instinct so she's like rocketing as fast like <laughs> as fast as she can because this thing can definitely definitely oh it's huge she's like the size of a pill to this thing right. it's chasing her so through the water she's doing like weaving and like special like She'll like, I don't know, special special swim moves, like trying to just out gun this thing. And she's hoping that if she can get enough momentum, it'll follow her <laughs> as she rockets up through the water and explodes like out of the water. 
and she's trying to get it so that she can like kind of fly up over the rig and have it just follow behind. And this thing, I, like the pictures, I would say probably do a better justice than I can, but the teeth and this just, you know, the, the, the noises that this thing is making underwater, it, it's, 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 uh, She's, she's still not having a good time, <laughs> but, um, yeah, she's going as fast as she can. She's kicking her little legs. Okay. So and... this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. All right. All right. I got it here. Boom. Oh God. I haven't seen that picture. <laughs> yeah. I just made these. Leviathan. Talk about it. So yeah, as so the the Vivian and Grizz are on like one wave ripper, and they got a little like a, a wave, a big wave coming behind them. The rest of her family zips off the rave with the other one, and like brings this huge, massive wave in. And like as that's coming, they just hear through the like cacophony of like the storm, this like <laughs> as this like huge fucking like just military gunship just like comes around the backside of the fucking tower, and like all of these lights like. <laughs> like blast into the fucking top of the tower where everybody is completely illuminating every, like Dash and Oscar and, and Feigl and everything and the ship is like um everybody get down and like there's like this like it drops and there's these like soldiers like putting their guns out and Feigl like raises her hands up she's like no 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 and like as that happens a bunch of ropes start like coming out of the side of the fucking ship and like soldiers like start propelling down on like towards the rig even though there's like tentacles like smashing them like taking them grabbing them ripping them off the fucking ropes like they're the the soldiers are still like coming down and then suddenly this fucking tiny little light just like bursts out of the tidal wave that's coming behind fucking adam uh cody and brody and it's the light of karina and as she bursts out of the fucking wave, just this like massive mouth dragon just follows her out of the wave over the rigs. And like Grizz is like down in the fucking boat with Vivian seeing this just like dragon explode out of the wave and like go above his head towards the rig where it just fucking smashes into the fucking military fucking gunship and just like rows of 10 foot tall fangs just like crush into the ship and it just explodes in its fucking mouth and oscar's up there screaming with dash like oh fucking shit and then the fucking triton and the gunship both disappear below the waves <sighs> and dr eichel's eyes turn wide and she looks at dash and she goes what the fuck was that that's the justice of Dolphine, bitch. <laughs> Oscar's like, yeah, bitch. And uh, Feigl's like, <laughs> and, and uh, Feigl's like, well, this is Kvindin justice. And she uh, raises, raises her gun up and uh, fires at Oscar. Oh. I mean, like, is, is Dash close enough that she can jump in front of the bullet? Adults. I mean, you could try. You could try, but I mean... I Block of the skill, though. I, I mean, I don't think you're faster than the bullets. Dash watches as Feigl shoots fucking Oscar three times. A bullet strikes off of his side, a bullet strikes off of his shoulder, and a bullet strikes off of his thigh. And he stumbles backwards near one of the like shattered fucking floor-to-ceiling windows and kind of like holds himself and looks over at V, and he's like... <sighs> It's okay. It's it's okay. And then he stumbles backwards and falls out of the rig into the water. What does oh. Dash do? The scream that this woman lets out is just it's anybody who hears it could like feel it in their core. And she's going to lunge at Feigl. And when she lunges, Feigl's like, what? He was against us! He was against us! And she's, like, trying to, like, block Dash's things. Grizz, roll observation. All right, so Grizz starts to tremble as he sees the man, the body of a man fall off of the rig and just, like, hit the water nearby as Vivian, like, pulls the boat up next to the rig and, and starts to, like, hops out to, like, climb onto one of the ladders to, like, make her way up. And she's like, come on! He goes into the water after the man. 
Uh, all right, roll a mobility minus two. Okay, so Grizz go dives into the water. Roll your panic. He dives into the water and freezes because what he sees underneath the waves is the fucking Triton. It is huge and it's massive. And it's just like swimming around, taking bites of this like, like uh, an iceberg sized fucking swarm of worms like underneath it. It's like taking bites of it. And fucking in the distance is this man's floating body but he's not close enough to reach it right now. And up in the, so he's got to come up to take another breath. Like after seeing this, it like freezes him and he lets out all of the air in his lungs. So before he can grab the still sinking Oscar, he has to go up and fucking take a breath. Okay. So in the, in the uh, upper control room, roll an, roll an initiative between Dyson, Dash and Feichel. Ooh. Dash goes first. What does she do? Oh my god, she's she's out for blood. Uh, she lunged at her. Gosh, does she have anything sharp on her? I would say that she sees that on Doctor Feichel's lab coat there is a scalpel. <laughs> so uh, Dash would like to take the scalpel and just go ham on her and um and try to stab at her heart okay all right so wow. roll your three panics you do one damage to dr feichel she's not dead the the vest definitely like fucking blocks some of the fucking the, the stuff she keeping it she's keeping it together but she starts trembling and she gets a nervous twitch her stress level goes up one and any agility rolls like uh like charging or you know any agility would be ranged combat mobility and piloting so if you want to avoid that you're going to want to stick to the close combat so she's like um her turn so she fucking aims the nine millimeter into dash's stomach and like digs it into dash's stomach and like tilts it upwards like towards her heart and just fucking Let's it go. Oh my god. Dash takes three damage. And they're basically grappling because she's like right up in her face, like stab the thing into her chest and, and Feigl just like <laughs> like into her stomach. Feigl's like, I should have killed you in my office when you showed up with your arrogant attitude talking to me like you knew what we were doing here. You don't understand my genius. Yeah, I guess I will use the scalpel to to slash at her, um, I guess her arm, her wrist, seeing if I can get deep enough to get her to drop the gun. Okay, okay, here we go, here we go. Oh, another three panics, awesome. Dash slashes out, doing one more damage to Feichel. She's almost down, and when she slashes... I mean, the, she, it's just a, it's just a, a, a scalpel. It's tiny. So it like bounces off of the bone. It cuts her wrist. She's bleeding. The woman's like, ah, and I'll say to hold on to the gun. I'm going to make her roll a stamina just to just, just for, okay. She does hold on to the gun. She's bleeding, but it bounces off the bone, and the, the scalpel then drops to the ground, which causes Dash to scream. She screams out, I'm going to kill you. Not before I kill you first, bitch. And Dash takes three more damage. It is now her turn again. Um, can I tackle her and then like just try and like beat her face in? Like Dash is very angry right yeah, now. She yeah. has a lot of aggression to get out. 100%. So roll your close combat. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude. Okay, so you beat her. So describe how Dash just, like, charges forward and, like, tackles Dr. Feichel and, like, takes her down to the ground. Um. So she hits her in the middle of the waist, and she, like, gets on top of her and just starts throwing her fist into uh, her face. Is she saying anything or screaming anything, or is she just laying into her? I mean, just a guttural scream as 
like it's a scream of of grief okay and as karina enters the doorway she sees dash on top of dr feichel and a nine millimeter handgun is like scattered out of dr feichel's hand to the side and like there's there's blood all over dr feichel's wrist but no wound and dash is just like pummeling the woman's face in like just breaking bones and like karina's watching is like as the bones break they they're like healing and like dr feichel is just like laying there laughing like a mad woman as like dash is screaming at the top of her lungs she will kick the gun and then try to i guess seeing that she's healing she's gonna just try to pull dash off of her and just say stop stop it's not gonna do anything uh dash is gonna thrash against her and she she killed him she shot him and she's just she's like her grief has turned into just full-on sobs and tears um seeing that she's like out for serious blood karina's gonna look around to see if she can find something that she could if she can manage to get dash off of her that she could like tie the doctor up with Okay, roll an observation for me. When Karina, like, sees this, like, cable running up, up alongside the walls, Dash watches as, like, she she goes over, the girl goes over and, like, grabs a hold of it to try to, like, rip it out. And there's this, like, spark that, like, surges through her fucking suit that, like, even though the, the ship is, like, the, the, the rig is out of power, like, fucking making a fucking full circle like that karina doesn't know shit about heavy machinery it definitely like charges her and like it bolts her backwards and she just like kind of tumbles backwards and like lands on the ground (laughs) unconscious again next to dash and like she has to like basically look between dr feichel who has like rolled over and is like you know pushing herself up as like blood drips off of her face and her bones like refit themselves um and karina who's like laying there unconscious and the gun is on the middle of, is in the floor in the middle of the room. Dash is gonna go for the gun. Okay. And roll a mobility for me. Alright. Dash successfully gets the gun. What does she do? Where's where's that handheld little bullshit thing that that she's been using to threaten Ada with? Oh, you wanna look for that? It is uh roll an observation for me. You would know that it is in her left jacket pocket because that is where she's pulled it out from before. Dr. Feichel turns and she looks back at her and she goes, You can't kill me. You know that. You admire me. All of this, it's out now. We can't control it anymore. Whatever comes from this, they're going to need me. If I'm not there, so many more people will die. You may be a genius, but you've done something that I can never forgive or forget. I will kill you. And when Dash raises up the gun to point it at Georgina, you think too small, Veronica Dashing Star. The uses of what we have could be beyond. One man's life means nothing in the greater scale of all of this. If you could see how much time and effort I have put into this project, he could not stand in the way. If you think it's fair to trade one man's life for this, then you've never experienced what love is. And when Dash says that, all of a sudden there's just this like, (laughs) as like the fucking tower crumples underneath the weight of the fucking worm that has been fucking growing up around it and restricting it this entire time and dash's feet just like shift out from underneath her and she's thrown to the side along with dr feichel and like karina's unconscious body just like slides into this fucking wall and they're both just like thrown completely off kilter as like the whole world gets upended and everything just spins ass over elbow just spinning like chaos crazy fire explosions like metal crunching Body's just getting thrown around. Uh, Karina, go ahead and uh, roll a survival for me. 
Oh my god, Karina survival! <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. So yeah, you very successfully fucking survived the collapsing of a building. So, standing in the middle of the stage, Roz and Cadmus face each other, swords raised. But you'll be, you'll be coward and live to be the show and gaze all this time. Hell hath thee, as our rarer monsters are, painted on a pole and under wit. Here may you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse. The Burnham would be come to Dunsinane, and thou opposed. Being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. Before my body I throw my warlike shield. Lay on, Macduff, and be damned him that cries, Hold enough. Roll close combat. Ros and Cadmus. Oh. Okay, so go ahead and describe as like go ahead and describe what happens is like they bring their swords up and like they clash. Raz raises his sword and they they he brings it down, but it's uh it's blocked by uh, Macbeth as the, the fight scene continues. Okay, roll it again. Go ahead and d- describe how Raz, like, fake strikes him this first time as a burst of, like, red flashing alarms start flashing throughout the stage, like, above Raz's head is, like, strong drum beats, like, from speakers, like, this increasing pace of a heartbeat. Like, describe, like, what happens. Um, as they as they they are pushed away from each other, and their swords, uh, their swords are still out as he's like shoved backwards. Um, Raz as Macduff turns and swings upwards, cutting across the chest of um, of Macbeth, uh, pulling the blade. So that it looks like the blade is running along Macbeth's body without doing damage to his friend. And, and go ahead. raises the blade up in a triumphant like swing as like it's sort of drawn out and dramatic. And and as Roz's arm goes up and like the the blade finishes striking strikes striking across Cadmus's chest, he actually throws his own sword. Like like the like the force of the strike like hits Cadmus so hard that he just dramatically lets go of the sword and it soars through the air like off of the stage as he like throws both of his hands up and he like tumbles backwards like down onto his knees and uh go ahead and describe how raz finishes Mac- or how mcdeff finishes macbeth um his arm comes down and he ends uh with uh macbeth having fallen to the ground driving the sword uh right in between uh, the space of his arm and chest on the opposite side of the audience, so it looks like he pierced him to the ground, um, and is like ends in that like that kneel, his head down, and the lights red over top. And the drums stop, and the red light fades as the actors playing Malcolm, Seward, and Ross arrive on the stage, flanked by extras playing the thanes and soldiers that all approach and surround Roz kneeling at Cadmus's body. 8.45 p.m. The salt trawler rig burns. Twisted metal, me- twisted melting metal girders and wires are fused to buildings and metal gratings of the rig. Lightning flashes, illuminating crashing waves and storm clouds above. Soldiers and workers scream in agony across the entire platform. Parts of the exploded gunship are scattered throughout the wreckage of the tower. Wrapped throughout the disarray like some kind of albino pile of coiled up white snakes, the quietest swarm writhes, reforging itself into something massive. Tendrils whip out instinctively everywhere at anything moving. Convendian soldiers and collection workers are beheaded, disemboweled, ripped to pieces, and thrown through the sky off into the ocean. So, Grizz, roll a mobility. Oh, man. 
All right. So first roll your two panics. Said two? Yeah. Okay. Keeps it together and he freezes. All right. So under as his second dive, he comes Grizz comes up to the surface, takes a big deep breath, dips his head back down under the water and sees Oscar's body sinking further. And he dives down, grabs a hold of the man, and starts kicking, swimming back up to the water's surface. And he gets up there and he freezes because he sees that like there's just this massive fucking explosion on the rig above. It's like this fucking huge worm is just like crushing everything down. And he's just staring up at it with just like a mixture of awe and confusion and fear and terror in his eyes. He's just... It's never seen anything like it. I mean, it's 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 like looking at a god, essentially. Dwarf. So is this all from the bottom, the the, the lab that Karina destroyed? Yeah. Oh wow. And the two labs, because Dash was in one of them and Karina was in the other one. And go ahead and describe what Dash sees when she wakes up in this twisted wreckage and sees that Dr. Feichel is outside of the building and like three fourths of her body has been like just charred and melted away. And she's like walking through the rain and like just sizzling, but like all across her body, the white worms are coming out and like starting to like stitch her back together. Dash doesn't see the gun anywhere. She doesn't see Karina anywhere. But she sees just Feichel and the chaos outside. Um, can she keep going after Feichel? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's going to keep doing that. Okay. Go ahead and roll your mobility to get up out of this fucking wreckage and get back there. And also, you're back to full hit points. Uh-oh, that scares me. Okay, so uh, roll your panic. Trembling. So as Dash pushes herself up out of the wreckage and, like, makes her way through this just, like, twisted, shattered, like, open, empty window out into the, like, storm and rain, instead of going after Feichel, she's just stuck when she sees her mother standing roughly 20 yards away holding a fucking assault rifle, wearing a riot vest and her father and like swinging the gun around her fucking shoulder. Vivian runs up, grabs a hold of Daz and she's like, Oh my God, you're okay. You're okay. And she just grabs Dash and like pulls her in. And like Adam is looking around right now for like any kind of threats. And what does Dash do? Uh, she, buries her face into her mom and she's like fully giving up um she's fully giving into her emotions and she just starts sobbing and she says i couldn't protect him um he's gone and um vivian's like who who's gone and she can barely choke out oscar and adam they adam and vivian just kind of like give each other this like just deeply pained look they should, that they share together and Ada looks at her and she goes what about Ada I, I don't know where she is last time I saw her she was alive and at that Dash looks and sees that Dr. Feichel is like nearly healed does she say anything to her parents about her uh, she tells him to aim for the heart. Oh, shit. Really? Yeah. And when Dash says that, without hesitation, Vivian turns and fires on the fucking, like, charred up, stumbling, healing body of Dr. Georgina Feigl. All right, yeah. So Vivian aims, fires, and Dash watches as, like, a single bullet, like, penetrates... Feigl's back and she falls to the ground. You don't know if she's dead, 
but she's laying there unmoving. And in the wreckage, Karina is laying there unconscious. Roll an observation for me, Dash. Okay. She sees that, like, there's just this pile of rubble and, like, twisted, melted metal laying across Karina over in, like, the corner. And that she's just mostly, like, trapped under this stuff. Um, are Brody and Cody around? They're not. Oh. They're down, down in the water. Okay. Um, they're, but she sees Karina over there. Yeah, they're the getaway peoples. Okay. Um, and she turns to her parents and she says, we... We gotta go back for Karina. She's over there, but she's got a big piece of metal across her. I need y'all's help. And Adam's like, lead the way. And as Dash and <clears throat> her parents sort of like rush across the rig, like avoiding these fucking tentacles, there's this up on a higher platform, <clears throat> like a, uh, a handful of soldiers that like, as they see them running, they like break into the gunfire, like towards the three of you. And they're like firing on you and they're firing on the swarm, but like the damage is moot. And like this massive gut like creature, like just fears nothing. And like when the handful of soldiers like stop firing and turn to flee, they're all just swept off the platform by like a massive white tentacle. And as she's running, Dash's vision struggles to clear through the thick roiling black smog surrounding them as it's like being cut by the rain of the storm. And like, what is she, is she thinking about anything at all as like, they're trying to like rush towards Craner right now? Uh, nothing super critical. Um, I mean, she, she's kind of stunned right now. Um, still trying to process what happened to Oscar. Um, so she's, she's pretty one track minded. When they get to Karina, roll a, uh, strength for me. Just a straight string? Yeah, just hit the strength. All right, roll, roll those two panics, but describe uh, like what Dash pulls off of her. Um, uh, Dash is using up the last bit of her adrenaline to dig through the rubble to get Karina and... Um, you know how they always say the stories of like superhuman strength and, you know, people lifting cars off of kids. Um, so she's like tossing aside these big metal sheets and um, like this, this beam that she needs help with. Uh, she, she needs a lot less help than she thought. Uh, but um, she eventually digs Karina out of uh like the bits and pieces of shipping container that's strewn about with like the help of her parents they get her out and at the last second this just massive just like like just like spiraling just tendril like fucking wave just like cascades down near them and she pulls them away and like yanks them to the side and adam is like like tapping karina on the side of the face and he's like hey, are you there can you hear me can you hear me? Are you all right? Are you all right? Um, and Dash, through this like bolt of lightning, cracks down, and another two like follow like in quick succession. And like as the area is lit up, she sees Ada, and the old woman walks alone across the center platform towards the massive, spiraling mass of white alien worms. Both of her arms are raised up towards the godlike mythological being as she drops down to her knees and starts screaming up towards it. From her place here, Dash can't hear what Ada shouts, but notices that whatever she's saying has garnered the attention of the great beast as it begins to morph in shape and shift its gaze down towards the frail old woman. When Ada sees this, Vivian screams, or when, when Vivian sees this, she screams, Ada, no! Get away from it! Run! Without thinking, what does Dash do in this moment? Uh, she runs towards Ada. Roll mobility. Mm. 
Yep. Mm -hmm. Panic. All right. That's perfect. So describe Dash clearing the gap through this just like hurricane of like swirling tentacles. Um, so she's going to try her best to um, dodge and weave and kind of like dive and, and duck. It's like full on action movie. Um, you know, she thought she was done, but here's Ada in danger again. And her, her adrenaline is ramping right back up. Okay. And the reason why she freezes is because right before she gets to Ada, she's just like scooped up by this fucking tentacle that like wraps up around her legs up to her up around her like hips and waist and chest. And she's kind of stuck and like, she's close enough now to hear that Ada's screaming over the chaos. She's like yelling at this creature. And this is a couple images that you guys see. She's like, I know you're scared. I know you're in pain and you're scared. I know just like you, I know you just like you know me. You know how much of these, you know how much I love these people. I, I can't lose them, please. You have to see. Not everyone wants to hurt you. You, you have, you have to take it back. I don't want what you gave me. I, you have to take it back. I, I can't be like you. I can't watch my loved ones grow older than me and die. I've lived my life. Life without them isn't something I can bear. Humans, we're not a hive mind, but we are meant to be together. Let us stay together, please. Let us stay safe. You don't belong here. You have to go somewhere that people can't find you. Please. I know you can feel my heart. Be better than us. Like moving like this just mountain. The massive being forms this just like humanoid arm. At the end of which is a fractal less and infinitely growing hand with just in, in, like a hundred fingers. Dash watches as the gigantic hand closes around Ada. As the quietest swarm hand releases, Dash sees that Ada hovers in the air a few feet off the ground. Millions of tiny worms gently wriggle out of every pore of her skin, her nose, her mouth, and her eyes. The worms float through the air to reforge with the massive quietest swarm. And unlike Project Union 1, who violently withered into a dusty crisp after the quietest ripped its worms out of it, Ada simply closes her eyes and descends gently to, down to the flooring of the rig. When the tentacles unleash Dash, what does she do? Uh, she runs straight for Ada. <clears throat> does Dash say anything to the swarm as it stares down at her? Like, and her parents, who have now rushed up and made their way to Ada's side as well, along with Dash, and like they're all sort of like protecting this old woman's body as this, um, this god being is looking down at them well that depends is ada alive ada is alive uh she she just kind of holds on to ada and looks up at the swarm and she just says thank you as she holds ada close and a deafening guttural shrieking pierce of an otherworldly roar vibrates the entire rig underneath everyone's feet as when Dash turns to look, she sees herself through another flash of lightning that the Triton has partially climbed up onto the rig platform, leaving herself, Vivian, Adam, and Ada now blocked on two sides by kaiju beasts. Flexing its upper body as the Triton moves further onto the platform, the beast roars again directly at the quietest swarm. Repeating the howl back at the Triton, the swarm begins to shift its form into something vaguely, from something vaguely humanoid, into something older, something great and reptilian. As Commander Torn descends beneath the clouds to see the destroyed rig below him, overtaken on one side by the Quietus, and on the other by a Triton, holographic diagnostics projected in the air before him from the central console show Karina's heartbeat and her pinpointed location on the eastern side of the rig, Grizz on the west, 
Zooming in the exterior cameras, he's also able to see Dash and her family squarely in the center of the two great beasts preparing to attack each other. What does Torn say and or do? Um, I would, I think Ibiav would be in, you know, the co-pilot chair at this point because we are in serious mode. Um, I would have hoped that she gave me as much of a briefing as we could because we probably tracked Grizz's heartbeat here as well as Karina's. Um, and seeing Dash there is like a welcome surprise, um, knowing that, you know, he hasn't seen her in a while. Um, as he's taking stock of everything, uh, he's not quite sure what he's run into, but he sees there's a lot of fucking damage and he has to get them out of there immediately. Um, so he would go to Ibiab as they like scoot out of the sky with a, he kind of goes to Ibiab. He's like weapons free. And at that, Ibiav just like unleashes a torrent of fucking plasma bolts along the back of the fucking Triton. And Dash is watching as just like streams of golden light are just like just like lit out of the fucking sky, like that glows the whole up area up is like the fucking golden, like reflective, beautiful fucking roving dawn is just above you guys, tearing light down onto the fucking Triton. And uh, I think he would definitely move into a strafing position where he's like trying to make sure that he's distracting these two massive creatures, but he's mostly just deadly fixed on making sure they get out of there alive. So um, he, I guess they don't have comms right now. No one can hear me dash, talk to them. Dash I, no, no. And like, I'd have so to go into, I'd have to go into speaker mode. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So after after Ibiav does the the volley, the initial volley, what what's the response of the kaiju? So the fucking Triton like turns to look at the ship, and it like roars and like swipes up at it. And the moment that it looks away from the quietest swarm, the huge fucking just like trillions and trillions of worms that like make this make up this thing all surge and move together and just collide in over like above and over dash and Ada and uh, Adam and Vivian and just across the torn washes as this thing just moves like a wave across the oil rig and collides into the body of the Triton and starts to just like fucking enter it like through its eyes through its nose through its mouth through its fucking cuticles and like the giant beast as like Ibiav is still just like blasting fucking shit into it it tumbles backwards off of the rig into the water disappearing jesus oh uh, so the, so they all just went to the water yeah okay um as soon as that happens Torn, uh, I would I would love to make sure that I'm catching all the possible heartbeats that are visible. Uh, he, scan, he scans the entire rig, including the, the near adjacent water. Roll me a com tech. All right. So when he does so, he sees that Dash is in the center with one, two, three heartbeats. Karina is her little designator. She's up on her feet and she's walking towards the four of them in the middle of the wreckage. And then Grizz is with three heartbeats. Two of them are good. One of them is very weak. And then there are three heartbeats along with 12 small heartbeats. And that is it. Okay, so uh, in terms of how far these groups are from each other, are they aware of each other? They're like, all within the span of like, you know, 50 yards. Okay, but just different heights, right? Yeah. All right, Torn, after, after the second volley with the Triton, he gets this like shiver going up his spine because he's never seen anything like this, but he knows he has to process it later. Just knowing that they're alive is the most important thing to him. Um, and he goes over comms and he shouts at the rig. He's just like, Good to see you all again. Can we all meet in one place, please? And he indicates uh, a location that seems equidistant to at least the people who are on the on the rig. And he flashes a light on it. So, as Karina sort of walks over to the group of the family, she sees like Dash. They're all cradling Ada, and Ada's breathing. Uh, and the old woman kind of like struggles to open her eyes and. She looks up and she goes, she looks and she sees Dash's face and Vivian and Adam and they're all kind of looking down at her and she goes, am I dead? 
No, Ada, you're very much alive, thank God. We don't have any time. We have to go. Dash, if you need help, I can help you. Yeah, we just need to get everybody onto the ship. Can you help me with Ada? Yes. I will. Pretend like she's not half dead. <laughs> Try to help. I mean, I'm sure Ada is easy to carry, so she'll, she'll help. And so... As they start like getting Ada up to move over, the the group of Oscar's three friends make it out with the children. They all kind of come out of where they were hiding, and everybody starts moving together. And Dash hears Brody from behind yell, "Mom, Dad!" And like when everybody turns to look, they see that like Brody and Cody are there and they're walking with Grizz and Grizz is carrying the like unconscious bleeding body of Oscar. Uh, Dash doesn't know how to how to react. Um, she shouts over to them. Is that Oscar? Oh uh, yeah, this is him. Is he still alive? Oh, yeah. He's a little banged up, but he's good. The amount of, like, relief that washes over Dash, but also, like, sick to her stomach. It's a weird spot she's in. We gotta find some place to lay him down. I can't hold him all night. He's gonna, he's gonna need to rest. We can get him onto the ship. All right. And Grizz just kind of like starts to carry him off to find some place where he like a bunk or something he can like clap him on. Okay. So um, as everyone kind of gathers and like Torn brings the roving Don around like level with the rig, you know, the whole group of people, all of you guys sort of like step off and make it on into the cargo bay. And Ibiav is you know, making sure everybody's coming in. She's, like, counting all the heads. Like, she's, like, completely shocked and confused to see all of these children. And she closes the door when everything gets closed. And she looks at Dash. And she goes, "That This must have been one hell of a doctor's appointment. Yeah, you could say that. I was going to say, Karina is going to say, I think we need to talk. I don't know what you were told but I don't think any of it was true yeah I think we need to talk but a sincere thank you for your help tonight I don't think I would have made it without you same thanks for all that back there yeah Torrance uh, he was severely watching the, uh, the, the cameras just like critically expecting a return from these fucking awful things he just saw but as soon as he sees everyone's in he recognizes that they're super bloody they're super fucked up they're super emotionally drained um and upon seeing that he he just kind of like sighs this sigh of relief because he realizes that this this went better than it possibly could have considering he wasn't around um and he and he comes over the the he comes over to the storage bay and he's just like uh, all right, I see we have some new friends, but uh, let's make sure they get home safely. And um, as he calms out, he kind of grits his teeth because he's really fucking mad. Okay. And so back at the theater, as Roz walks back onto the stage, the set is new. He's holding a prop that's projecting a holographic image of Cadmus' severed head as he plays dead from behind the stage. Hail King! For so thou art, behold where stands the usurper's cursed head. The time is free. I see thee compassed with my kingdom's peril. That speak my salvation in their minds. Whose voices I desire, aloud with mine. Hail, King of Dauphine! And the actors on stage portraying thanes and soldiers all raise up their swords and shout, Hail! King of Dauphine. To be continued. How dare you? Oh. <laughs> How dare I? Right. How dare you? How dare I what? <laughs> to be continued. 
<laughs> no, he's perfect. Obviously. Yeah, you, we need a cliffhanger after something like that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of. I mean, honestly, I there's more we could do. It's just late. I would leave it up to you no. guys. Like, <laughs> I, just, I need to go to bed. Yeah, I work in the morning.